Hello everybody, welcome to the World of Brick Films podcast. I am your host, William of AW Studios. Joining with me as always is my good friend and co-host, Sean Willis of City Panther. Hello again. And uh, our special guest today is, uh, I'll probably be saying very similar to what I said when we had David Pagano on, on the uh, podcast, but uh, yeah, as someone who has done so many things, uh, he is the you know, creator of The Night News at Nine, which is an amazing brick film series, um, as well as the uh, co-author of the Lego animation book um, with Dave Pagano, um, and yeah, so many, so many more other things which we all, we all uh, undoubtedly talk about, uh, you know, through the through this episode. Um, yeah, uh, Dave, Dave Pickett, welcome. Hey, it's me, Dave <laughs> Vo Pickett. Hi. <laughs> Do I need to say anything else? Thanks for the introduction. That's me. Yeah, I think, you know, again, um, you're somebody who we, we would have had in mind ever since starting the podcast, what, six years ago now. And I think we were sort of sometimes we kind of wait for people to have like some new release or something before we ask them. Um, so that's kind of why, <laughs> I haven't made anything no. in six years. Yeah, <laughs> that's kind of why we haven't had you on, because, yeah, the, the time in which we've been doing this podcast just so happened to coincide with the same years in which you haven't pre- really been releasing trick films yeah but uh well congratulations on recently hitting a million youtube subscribers thank you yeah, yeah no th- there now you have a, a an in yeah. for the podcast right one one million subscribers the one million uh, subscriber special i'm looking at my gold play button uh in the corner right now it's uh it's actually really nice i was skeptical because they changed the style of play button so my silver is the it's like a button in a frame and this is more of like a recessed button shape in a rectangle if that makes sense and i was like oh i don't know if i like the new ones but they look much better in person than they do on youtube's website so it's pretty good i like it and actually, did you yes. expect that you'd hit a million? Because I know that, like, you kind of, um, like, stopped, re- like, posting on YouTube regularly a couple of years ago. Yeah, about six years ago. So right as you started this podcast, uh, 2018 was really when I stopped uh, posting videos on a regular basis. And at that point, I don't know, I was probably at 700,000-ish. I'd have to look back. And... I didn't really have an expectation of if or when, but Hmm. um, a lot of my content's evergreen, so it has continued to attract an audience. And so I have known for about a year and a half that it would eventually happen. It was just kind of a question of when. Um, And so it happened to come in uh, just a couple months ago, almost right on my birthday, which was Hmm. like a really nice happenstance. So uh, it worked out. But yeah, the channel... Gosh, when did I start it? 2009? So, uh, what is that? Oh, 15, 15 years, years ago. Yeah. Oh, yeah. wow, was that 15 already? <laughs> Older than some of yeah. some brick filmers, you know. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, true. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I hate to see on YouTube when something in the related video says 15 years ago, and then you click on it and it's from 2009. <laughs> <laughs> like, it doesn't yeah, feel right. I still think the 90s were yesterday, yeah. so, you know, it's a problem. Um, but actually, it's interesting that you mentioned the content being evergreen. I mean, I guess I feel like I'm used to the idea of like big major YouTube channels. You know, not they don't have a lot of evergreen content. Like it feels like if they if they stopped uploading, then you'd expect them to kind of just like n- not really gain that many more hundreds of thousands of subscribers. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how much you want to talk about YouTube versus <laughs> brick filming yeah. here, because like <laughs> you get me going, I I could fill two hours just about. <laughs> Uh, YouTube's algorithm and what types of contents it rewards and how that's changed over time, yada, 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 Um, (laughs) you know, might be topic for a different day. Yeah, it's it's sort of interesting to me as, you know, I've essentially been observing YouTube like for 15 plus years like that. I'm not not trying to play the game, but it's, it's just kind of an interesting thing to observe in the way it changes over time, I think. Um, yeah, I mean, I remember when Brick Films were, you know, hosted MOV files hmm. on a website, right? Before, pre-YouTube. So um, it's it's definitely been a great way to encourage discoverability of Brick Films beyond just, you know, when they were hosted on yieldybrickfilms.com. Mm-hmm. 
uh, or other people's personal sites, um, right? And yeah. like, there are certainly brick filmers who are chasing the YouTube algorithm. Like, I don't know, whoever made like Hulk gets attacked by a shark or what is like the most viewed <laughs> Lego <laughs> animation? Last one, I haven't checked yeah. for six years, but- He's like, like, like a, a shark, attack time shark attack, yeah. Yeah, 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 something like that. Which there are like fifty different variants of, mm -hmm. just like you know, the same uh, thumbnail but just like a different minifigure. Yeah. Uh, so you know, it's definitely a route you can take. Versus what was um, the guy who would make like pizza delivery mm -hmm. and all those kind of brick films, uh, yeah. like Michael Hickox. Yeah, yeah, like that was the first person to really like be at the top of YouTube with brick films, which were they're not just mashing keywords; they were like hmm. actual thoughtful creations but you you know you can see how different people have played the youtube game differently with brick films i never really brick film played the youtube algorithm it didn't really work for me that way so i ended up doing a whole other you know type of video content like my uh how to build videos yeah. are really like the bread and butter of my youtube growth long term um and uh you know but that's interesting though not yeah. at all yeah i feel like that's interesting that like you were you kind of were able to kind of separate both the kind of more um well yeah the more kind of I guess passion projects stuff like um, like news at nine and and not really worry too much about it kind of feeding a specific algorithm whereas like with uh, but you were able to also do videos that were like not brick films that were it would do well i think in a way maybe doing both those things helped you separate those two things in a way because um, I think that there is a there can be a bit of a problem sometimes. Um, I'll say problem is probably a, is probably the wrong word for it. But there there is a kind of trend I see um, of um, people kind of seeing everything as being like you know, my brick films have to be content. They have to be following a YouTube trend. Um, but like I think one of the things that makes your films really just like um, so evergreen and so kind of like um, and just yeah they don't age um is the fact that like you weren't that wasn't the you know on the mm. you know the priority in your mind when you were when you were making those things you know yeah no i um in my the, the later era of youtube i started doing um videos that were narrative and chasing algorithm things where i just didn't animate them i literally put lego figures on plastic stick, sticks and waved them in front of the camera um, which again have way more views than my uh, <laughs> nightly news at nine videos, or at least some of them do. And it's like, you know, those videos are I had fun making them, and that's actually when I had an employee, and like I was like, hey, you can write the script for this, whatever. I don't care. Like we we just need to have something that's like timely and throw in as many Five Nights at Freddy's references because that's what the algorithm wants from us. But it's yeah, it's not. I don't have any sort of. Uh, strong artistic attachment mm. to those i called those brickverse videos so my lego role play uh videos versus the nightly news at nine which is you know the core of my oeuvre as a brick filmer but certainly the way i remember it like i remember nightly news at nine being a, a major brick film series you know in 2009 and the early 2010s like major in terms of getting views as well as well as, well as just being great <laughs> hmm yeah, I, I mean, I think, again, right, it, it's so hard to rewind your mind to 2009 and how YouTube was back then. Like, partner program was just getting started, so, like, monetization was not possible at the way it is now or, like, as clear of the focus for YouTube. It was much more, like, this is just an easy way to share videos. And um, so when I started the Nightly News 9, I didn't think about online advertising as a possible revenue source. Mm -hmm. I was thinking I'll create a series a la Homestar Runner and <laughs> then make t-shirts. And that's how I'll make money somehow. You know, um, South Park gnome step two meme <laughs> insert here. Um, classic. So yeah, so my, I was more like, because Night Lose and Nine was like intended to be a something that could make money right i didn't not want that but it was more through let me make really cool memorable characters and tell stories that will bring people in and then they'll want to show that through 
other kind of merchandising opportunities that never really worked, right? I, I sold the DVDs for Night Losing Nine, and I tried a couple other things, but um, it's just, it's really hard. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then also, I then trying to also then produce more content, and yeah, so many things. I, and even so, I think that, like, if you made it now on YouTube, like, it certainly wouldn't reach even the the minor heights that it got to back then like i feel like if you could spend five years making night news at nine chapter three and like you know the people in bricks and motion would love it and like some well you have a subscriber base so they'd like it but yeah no the 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 ecosystem has shifted so much right i when i started on i i I've said this in multiple times, but I try to say it any time I'm officially on the record, is that my best advice for somebody who wants to create a successful YouTube channel is to start in 2007, right? <laughs> like, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> I was there when there was very little Lego content overall on the platform. So it was much like the f- very first video I uploaded to my first YouTube channel, Fallen Tomato, deep cut for, um, you know, some people who know what the Frankie job is. Mm-hmm. Um, got on the YouTube homepage, right, before there was even, like, the, you know, your watch page or whatever, and it was just a really bad, you know, Lego Mario video, but it was, um, you know, it was unique content at that place, mm-hmm. and now, you know, now it wouldn't even rate, but it got, like, ha- half a million views, or it's, like, something ridiculous, mm-hmm. right, and, like, for <laughs> the time, also, yeah. it was an astronomical number, and it's, like, that is the ecosystem I started in. And, you know, once I was able to refine my content more, because at that time I was making 60 minute YouTube or Lego movies that were poorly animated at like three and a half frames per second and involved lots of complicated references to English literature and didn't make any sense. And that is not what, like YouTube had a 15 minute time upload Mm -hmm. back then. (laughs) And so then I, I actually designed the Nightly News at Nine to be something that worked in the YouTube format where I could have an individual standalone video, but then, you know, kind of have a deeper narrative thread that would be revealed over, you know, multiple YouTube instances. Because again, at that point, I couldn't have even uploaded the full chapter one as a single video um, until, you know, I think maybe 2011. Again, like it's hard to even remember mm-hmm. what youtube's features were at different points and times now but yeah so it was intended to be um it was made for the youtube platform in some ways but you know then the platform kept shifting and nightly news at nine was not the thing and so i shifted my brand my business to brick 101 because the the how to build videos were actually what was more friendly for the algorithm and at that point i could upload an hour long video of me showing detailed how to make a thing I had already built <laughs> and then I took suggestions and yada 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 anyway I'll stop talking actually did you <laughs> did you have it in mind that making how to build videos could become more successful or did you just start those because people in the comments were asking oh how did you make that on my news and nine episodes yeah so I actually started it with my kickstarter for nightly news at nine chapter two um because I was trying to promote the kickstarter and I was like I need video content that I can make quickly to promote the fact that I'm trying to raise money. And so I was like, oh, well, I'll just show how to build these few little things. So I did like five of them. I forget if I did that in a week or something like that. And then um, I realized like, hey, I've built so many different things. This is content I can produce that's going to fill gaps between what I thought was then going to be a monthly release schedule. But of course, Nightly News at Nine, I just kept making more and more ambitious. Mm-hmm. And so it would take me five months to make a 30 second animation because, <laughs> you know, robots, 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 yada, yada, yada. <laughs> but, um, and then, yeah, I just at a certain point realized, oh, I can take, re- people started requesting after I had just done a bunch of videos based on things I had already did just to fill space. And then I started like categorizing and counting those requests and be like, oh, a lot of people have asked me to do Sonic the Hedgehog. Let me do that. And then I did. And that was one of my first how to build videos that really blew up. And then that strategy is what I used um, to guide a lot of the content. That's how I discovered Five Nights at Freddy's, which was like my kind of peak era of influence probably on YouTube was 
the Lego Five Nights at Freddy's, McFarland Toys Five Nights at Freddy's stuff era. So, but it was not what the I had started YouTube for, right? Like, yeah, I started as like a creative endeavor for narrative stop motion animation. Um, so yeah. And I'm sure I would have first heard of Five Nights at Freddy's from your videos because you were really early with that, I think. Yeah, so that was one of the, the really powerful things about when kids were allowed to comment on YouTube before <laughs> that all yeah. got shut down is that um, I kind of had an insight into the um, the collective knowledge base of children who wanted to see things made out of Lego. Um, so I learned... I was making Lego Minecraft things before Lego was making Minecraft things. Um, and, you know, not like I f discovered Minecraft, but from a like, oh, this is a really powerful combination. I kind of got that as an insight from my comment base, turned it into, you know, a thing that I kind of owned the search results on mm. YouTube for a long time before Lego <laughs> <laughs> stepped in. <laughs> Um, and then was always kind of like, what's the next thing like that where I can be kind of like an early adopter of, uh, I, you know, like I tried it with Fortnite, but it was like, it didn't really pan out. And that's kind of when I was exiting. But like, yeah, Five Nights at Freddy's started popping up and I noticed it because it wasn't the most requested thing at that point that I did my first one. But the rate at which I was getting requests for it was really high. So it was like a lot of people were suddenly asking for something I'd never heard of. Mm. And uh, it happened to like fall in line with my aesthetic of character driven Lego builds really well. Um, and then yeah, so I got into it again before a lot of people over the age of 13 knew it existed um so hmm. yeah it's an interesting way to kind of be ahead of the curve um which kind of yeah like yeah i guess this wouldn't happen nowadays with the with the whole kind of thing with yeah kids not being able to comment on videos <laughs> this thing i do think about quite a lot uh is the the fact that like um if you wanted to make that kind of content now that it was sort of catered towards you know more of um a younger audience you would basically have to make your videos you know i guess for children which means that you just wouldn't have any comments like and i've always found that a bit kind of weird the um the you know like nowadays seeing that on youtube where like you'll see a video that gets you know it can get millions of views but then there's like literally like zero comments um i don't know that just feels very weird to me <laughs> yeah no i mean they literally um dismantled what was the core engine of my business uh, <laughs> when I was doing Brick 101 full time, right? Like the comments <laughs> were my main like source of insight of to what I could do that would be, you know, kind of pop off in those in those ways because it was driven by, you know, what people on the pop, you know, I, I'm sure there's ways to do it now just by watching what gets views. But, you know, because it was specifically people already watching my content requesting something, right? It was like, it was like a really specific insight into what the audience I had already cultivated wanted. Mm. And so it would do well. And then YouTube would show it to more people. So, um, yeah. Uh, but yeah, no, like they totally dismantled that side of the thing. So my business, in addition to having to start it in 2007, like it, YouTube now it would not work on period. Yeah. Even if you could so yeah, you never um... start it now. Yeah, I think that's just been a long running issue with people trying to make it work on YouTube is that literally any day they could just flip a switch and just kill your entire thing. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I've said a lot about YouTube. Um <laughs> but <laughs> I, I, I'm still, you know, really grateful for yeah. being able to do what I did and I think oh, yeah, sure. have a much better relationship with uh, creators on their platform than, for instance, TikTok <laughs> or a lot of the other platforms that are, you know, trying to do something similar. YouTube still has a pretty good um, relationship and, like, clear um, set of standards yeah. and uh, ways you could get information from them about what they're doing. But, yeah, they're, it, building your business on a, a single other business's platform is always going to be inherently um risky and come with you know that kind of stuff and i guess it also it's sort of like i guess nothing personal sometimes when i feel like a lot of those youtube 
kids changes the comment section and stuff came in the wake of like adpocalypses and the like Elsa Gate controversy. Like they weren't exactly trying to kill off creators, but it it sort of happened. Things were out of their control, I suppose. Yeah, no, they they did it because the FTC was investigating them for violating the Children's Online Protection and Privacy Act. So yeah, uh, I get it. <laughs> I, yeah. I, I literally have like a 5,000 word article about how I figured out why my business was destroyed. Yeah. So, <laughs> but I, yeah, I, I have no ill will towards, towards YouTube in that sense, but uh, I'm very grateful now to have a, a job where I do web design for the government. It is the exact opposite of running my own business. Mm -hmm. I am a cog and a giant machine and I love that stability just for my mental health yeah you can you can turn your brain nice. off at the end of the the job <laughs> you know i just you, you know you don't have to look at a wall of comments saying do this and do that <laughs> okay yeah no, it's not quite the same uh, way at least anyway but yeah and but, the, the the grammar is a lot better usually from adults than it was from children in the comments so that's helpful too <laughs> before we get too yeah. distracted talking about youtube because i mean there are other tangents i could go on about how they they still need to clean up some of the things they push especially if you're if you go onto youtube and you're not signed in like the stuff that gets recommended to you initially is horrific but um but instead of talking about that i i think we ought to, ought to do the regular sort of go back to the start questions because well it's interesting that you're mm, yeah you were somebody who was brick filming before like there was brick filming activity online so i wonder if you could talk about how you um started out brick filming and like what time frame that would have been yeah so um it's around 1993 or 1994 would have been when my family got a, a home video camera, which at that time was like a rare thing. Not smartphones were not even a, a twinkle in Steve Jobs' eye yet. Um, you know, so it was this big bulky camera that took these um, like VCR mini tapes and you could record on. And I had a Lego Dragon Masters set with you know a dragon and some guards um and i remember very clearly um that it wasn't animation it was just again me kind of puppeting the characters but i remember uh and i i it is lost to time this recording of uh my very first like lego movie um when i was again yet yeah, like eight or nine in the 90s using the height of technology but i only had one copy of it and it was on a VHS tape. So I could had to put it in a VCR physically to show it to anybody, right? Mm -hmm. So the audience was my family <laughs> and that was mm -hmm. it. Um, and then I started realizing uh, for school projects, anything that had some sort of presentation requirement, I was like, I'm just gonna make a, a Lego video for this. I don't wanna stand up there and talk. I'll just have them wheel in the uh, the TV with the VCR, and then I'll play a Lego movie. <laughs> um, so I did a couple things like that in middle school and high school. Again, before like web distribution of video was really possible at scale. Um, you know, like in high school for me, early two thousands, like that's when we maybe got like Monty Python and the Holy Grail Lego video on you know Spite Your Faces website or something and it was mostly people saw it as a dvd at easter egg but then it was like on like a website as a, an mov file if you knew that it existed kind of thing um so i was still mostly making things for just like my friends um, when i went to college then i joined the film group there and so i would screen my lego creations in like a film theater on campus so that was like the escalation of like what it was possible of like how many people could see my lego movies at once um and at that point i was still using like a old school video camera not you know stop motion properly and it had a button where it would take a screenshot quote unquote but it was like um i don't know like a third of a second or something like that that it would just take a static picture. So that's where my frame rate was just determined by this feature on Sony, Sony video cameras mm. of how long it would record to tape because it was that's what it was doing, um, a still image, quote unquote, if that makes yeah. sense. Hmm. Nice. It's still more advanced than just hitting the re record and hitting stop as fast as you can. Yeah, I did yeah. some of those <laughs> way back when, but then they added the like, take a screenshot or it, 
image capture, and it would go, oh, it, there was a, it would go boop, 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 um, to indicate that it had started and stopped recording. And my roommates in college hated that sound, but never told me. It was optional. I could have turned it off, <laughs> but it was like really good feedback for me as like in the animated mm. zone. Like, yes, I captured that image. Like, move the Lego figures. Boop, boop, boop. Move the Lego figures. Boop, boop, boop. Um, but yeah. So... It's like the um, the precursor to the um, sound effects on um, Dragon, Dragon Frame, Frame, basically. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, yeah. So, um, uh, yeah, if, if that that was really how I, I started brick filming. And then that was the very first Nightly News at 9 video. Um, if you go back to the very first video on that channel, it's like news announcement or something. And it's about Phil's briefcase being stolen. Um, and then you find out that it's you know, Malifio stole his briefcase. It's really short. That was done in that format, but it was at a time when I had gotten much better at that and like then knew how to speed it up. So I could do something that was closer to like 10 frames a second, but still was using that as my primary thing. Cause I didn't have a webcam. A lot of people in the community were starting, but like my practice was so tied to this one type of video camera um, that that was just what I knew and how I worked best at that time. Um, and that's, like, that's, yeah, that's really impressive that you were able to, to do, to do that. Um, yeah. Where's my briefcase it, with that same format? Like clearly you were able to, to work with those limitations really well. <laughs> and, and the way I would do animations then is I would film the animation with a sense of the script but then I would have the voice actors record to my animation. Like they would, uh, and like, I would just like do it a couple times until it kind of synced up pretty well, which is obviously not how <laughs> most <laughs> stop motion animation gets made in a pipeline sense. Um, so that was basically how yeah. I started. Yeah. <laughs> but that, you know, you get an intuitive sense of, you know, whatever frame rate you're speaking at or, you know, filming at and uh, how long you need and, it, you know, and then with editing, you can always stretch out some frames and whatnot. Um, but yeah, it was, and then, oh my gosh, uh, I, I, I started trying to, uh, for Nightly News at Nine, Chapter One, that was really the first time I recorded something in advance and then had a an X sheet or whatever that is, you know, the thing where you figure out what frames are corresponding to what words the character is saying, but it was hmm. all done by paper, by hmm. hand, manually well, for me. Yeah. It's kind of one of those things where, like, um, you know, you can work with, you can work with those limitations uh, if, if that's kind of like how you started out, but as soon as you get to a point where you're not having to do that anymore, it's like, yeah, you probably, it'd probably be very hard to go back to that, you know? Yeah, <laughs> like that is, I, I can still kind of animate in a, uh, like if I'm just doing a test or something, like I don't necessarily need to like watch onion scanning or something like, you know, I can just kind of do it by feel real quick for like a first pass and then, you know, go back. Um, but that's usually just for like a lighting test or something like that. If, um, you know, it's obviously way better <laughs> to plan it all in advance. Um, but, you know, another part of my style, because that was like my way I started brick filming was very improvisational and I'll figure out the script later that, you know, bled into Nightly News at Nine, even though at that point I did have a DSLR and did it, you know, frame by frame um, that I would in the as I was animating, just come up with an idea for like a random thing to happen in the background and then just do it. Um, which, uh, you know, is again, not, I don't know, like the way you're supposed to animate, but, you know, I think it really gives Nightly News at Nine a distinctive flavor, yeah. especially chapter one was, was very kind of still half improv, half planned. Like all the script scripted things were actually done to a pre-recorded thing at that point but like a lot of the actions that happened on screen i didn't storyboard in detail i was just like all right this person will be talking and i'll figure out a background and something might happen there we'll see i, I know in my own brick films i'm a, you know i only ever want to animate like the character that's actually talking like i i always try to like reduce the amount of you know background people walking or 
traffic or whatever. So it does stand out to me a lot that in 19s at 9, there's always funny characters going around in the background and there's people driving around, you know, like Fabuland figures in little cars driving around in the back. Like, it's so active. <laughs> I think I, I, I described it on one of the previous podcasts as that it feels excited to exist. <laughs> mm, yes, I remember that. Thank you. No, that was probably yeah one of the most insightful uh descriptions of my work so i really appreciated that yeah we, we, we uh, it's funny to think that i was we were talking about this like two years ago at this point but uh i remember we, we did a, a quite an extensive discussion on um 90s and nine with jenny peppers um mm-hmm. that was uh yeah like a, a really great kind of you know in-depth conversation <laughs> yeah and i think there's like just so much to um the world of 90s and nine um, where like it, it very much like exists in its own kind of world, but like uh, you know, and but in you know in in a way you know there is there is so much to it which is like more meaningful than just you know like it, it, it it's relatable outside of just its its own world you know like and clearly you know there are like there's a lot of stuff you can kind of pick up from it I feel like you know that are applicable to uh, the the real world. <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, like, I I spent, uh, like, a couple years workshopping the scripts and stuff and had, like, you know, essentially, like, a show Bible of what I believe, understood about the world and how, like, I thought it could represent how the world could or should be or what this world, uh, if if Lego world did was a real place, like, what would it be like to be able to take anything apart at any moment, right? Like, <laughs> like that is... Um, you know, like that has deep philosophical implications <laughs> for what it means to exist. Um, you know, the Lego movie didn't really get into that level of <laughs> um, horror. Like, you know, they used it more in a cool way. But, um, you know, uh, if you really take the the principles that are, you know, embodied in the Lego system of, you know, anything can connect to anything, the 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 clutch power, right, is strong enough to keep it together when you want to, but also to pull it apart when you want to, Well, right? Like it's this really, really mechanically specific level of connection that Legos have that allows both the ease of putting together and staying together and pulling apart, which is, um, anyway, yeah. uh, again, I could talk about Lego as a subject <laughs> without brick films for five hours. So. I, I do often say, <laughs> I. I like to sort of show people Nightly News at Nine at any opportunity I get. And I, I like to say that it's um like some of the best use specifically of the brick film medium itself. Like it's not it's not just films that are just just so happen to be made with Lego. Like it, it actually uses the fact that it's made of Lego. And I find that really interesting. And it's, it's something that I've really been thinking about more so in recent years as like a good use of the medium. Oh, absolutely. I think like you, you, you really showcase that in, in things like... Um... You know, with, with Robophilia, um, mm-hmm. like that, you know, the fight, the fights um, in uh, in Chapter Two, um, that like, there's just so that much fight kind scene, of... thirty yeah. seconds, totally improv. <laughs> really, wow. <laughs> yeah, that, that's... I, I'm crazy. Like, I had them record <laughs> a bunch of fight sounds, and then I took those fight sounds and made it into like thirty seconds of what sounded like a fight, and then I just improv their entire battle sequence. Uh, at once and there's something that happens in the background too because of course yeah. i did it's ridiculous i i'm a crazy person that one's always stood out <laughs> to me greatly yeah and it's you know it's it's a real showcase of showing that like you know a, a fight scene in lego can be you know special <laughs> <laughs> oh god don't get us started on fight ways scenes of doing it. films these days <laughs> but i find it interesting that you know recently i've sort of been digging up like um Brick films made in the 90s on uh, VHS. And, like, you know, most of the people from who made, like, one or two brick films back then, almost none of them carried on with brick filming as, like, a long-term hobby. And so I kind of find it interesting when there are people like you and David Pagano who were doing that uh, VHS brick filming in the 90s and also active in in the early 2000s, but, like, sort of on your own track, like, not not part of the um, established community in that time. And I, I feel like Nightly News at Nine, um, it, like it's not, it's not just rooted in like the, the sort of community standards and um, like stock way of doing things. 
um, which works to his benefit greatly. Yeah, I if you look, watch chapter one, there is like no no walk cycles. In mm-hmm. it. I hate yeah. walk cycles. <laughs> like, it's like the least interesting part of brick filming to me is like a character walking. Um, so <laughs> that's one of the reasons I chose the format of a new show because it's a lot of people sitting or standing still talking straight to a camera. Um, <laughs> so right, like it's. Uh, yeah, like my, um, again, like brick film background is very different than like the the bricks in motion or brick film forums kind of like approach to a first brick film or yeah. whatever. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I mean, to your point about like, um, I guess like, so in, you know, the, the, the general lego fandom there used to be this term of like the dark age like when you stop playing with lego as a kid and then there's a dark age and then you might reconnect with as an adult i think that as a concept is disappearing now because lego actually cares about adult consumers (laughs) finally um (laughs) but i i i think that um people who actually as a kid were able to make brick films and then grow up into adults they we're still not at that point no right like people my age are now like maybe having children and maybe reconnecting with the hobby and might come back so it's like insofar as that was a phenomenon in the general lego community i think we're still um a little far away and that's why i think david pagan and i were such outliers is that we just didn't leave (laughs) um (laughs) And so we were some of the, like, quote unquote, elder brick filmers who had some connection with the community, even though we weren't ever as deep in, like, the forum culture as y'all. Yeah, because, like, I know, like, I feel like most of us, like me, like, I would have started, you know, I started by seeing, like, dynamic duo films on YouTube and then just copying those. Um, So, like, then the style is sort of very much rooted in what other people are doing, whereas your track was very different and so you like establish your own unique style more naturally uh but i wonder uh, what do you remember about like finding other brick films online like you know mid 2000s like before youtube or right at the start of youtube yeah so um you know again the spite your face monty uh python and the holy grail dvd extra um that is one of the first one i remember and then the Spider-Man 2 fight with Doc Ock, again, spite your face. Um, those are two of the first, like, an- like an- Lego animations that weren't mine that I remember ever seeing. And there was some stuff in early Lego commercials, but I don't know that I actually saw any of those um, when I was, like, I've seen them mm-hmm. now, but I don't think I saw any of them as a kid or anything like that. So... And then uh, there were, there was like some really long like Star Wars brick film that was like set in between <laughs> episodes like one and two or two and three because episode three wasn't even out at this point. Um, that I forget what it was called, but it was like they kept talking about the power of the Force and there were exponents and it was like this long jokey film. I remember like downloading <laughs> that as like. A really big at the time you know two gigabyte yeah. or maybe a hundred megabyte compressed mp4 or mov file the, do you know what i'm talking the, about the great you... disturbance by left field studios yeah the okay the great disturbance there you go so <laughs> and there, there there were definitely like other things i watched at that time um i just don't have a great grasp on all of them but i'm sure if i were to watch your you know, thoughtful documentaries about that time period, I would be like, oh, yeah, I remember that one. Yeah. yeah. But they wouldn't have been particularly influential on you because you were already established in, in your own sort of world. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, again, to the extent that um, my style was... Yeah, and I'm I, honestly, like, nobody back then was doing the kind of brick films I wanted to do, really, like... They, uh, like I enjoyed watching um, the Great Disturbance, but that was not really what I was trying to do. Um, I remember being impressed by like their waves. 
because um, I think they did some really good brick built waves. And so those like I would if there was like a practical effect that I I thought was really cool, I would look for that. But again, um, practical effects have never really been a huge part of the brick filming community style. Um, you know, it's definitely something that I have always really enjoyed yeah. and put effort into. And there's, you know, people I who, who have um, some of the ones we're going to talk about today, you know, that's why I love them is because they also have a similar kind of commitment to that kind of um, diegetic reality of like, this is happening in universe. Like, it's, uh, it's not just something added on it feels yeah. um cohesive that way i mean yeah i certainly do remember in like the earlier years of youtube people seemed to be impressed by digital effects like purely just because they were digital but in more recent years it feels like there's been more of a push towards doing stuff with bricks and doing stuff in camera and practically and people you know people hyping up the fact that it's actually in camera done with like real practical lights and... you can attribute a lot of that to the lego movie yeah, i feel like that movie. really kind of popularized it in uh, the wider kind of um, book film community um, but I think there were you know there were certain people who were, were doing that before you know that they they were doing it before it was cool mm -hmm. <laughs> I feel like there's something that you you touched on um, Dave then about like um, you know there being certain people who weren't necessarily like always in the kind of uh, the forum sort of side of, of the community but uh, who were I don't know they're, they're kind of um, their kind of style of films, the type of things that they were making, um, was quite different. Um, you know, I, I think we can you know, see there's some of the examples we, we could we talk about later. I feel like uh, people who are not always on the forums, I guess. And I think maybe there is like a, a difference in, in terms of like the kind of influences they were drawing from, but also just kind of like the, the, the style. It's not, you know, really too influenced by, on like, you know, this other brick filmer or, you know, that kind of thing. And I think that's it, it does it does lead to some kind of quite fresh ideas i guess um I, I find it interesting that you mentioned that people back then weren't making the, brick, the type of brick films that you wanted to make because in over the years uh certain people on bricks emotion have talked about the frankie job uh it's sort of a cult classic i would say but um how was the reception of the frankie job when you would have posted it in the community in 2007 uh yeah so um i made that again in my college context there was a film festival where um the conceit was a bunch of us were going to make films all using the same script i added a bunch of stuff to that script <laughs> uh for the frankie job but like all of the do spoken dialogue in the movie that's not voiceover is like the actual lines that we all did from so that was the context in which i made it um and uh you know I remember like that screening again at my college movie theater more than I remember the reception on bricks in motion. I remember that was like one of the first films I felt was meaningful enough to post there. And that like, it did get um, a good reception because like before that, like I had these really long, like hour long, not well, super well animated things that were rambling and I might, take a specific moment that was like a, a, a clip and share that but it wasn't like a complete story so I, that that was like one of the first things i had that was even applicable to share in that kind of context where again this was maybe i i it must i think it was on youtube but like not everything was even youtube at the at, in those days so yeah i mean the people on the forum would have still been downloading it as an individual file even if it was on youtube um you know i feel like in my mind even though the frankie job it doesn't have like you know the <laughs> the smoothest animation but to me it, it's held up a lot better than a lot of other 2007 brick films that were like more hyped at the time like it's if i think the frankie job is more like artistic and interesting and unique have we have we ever showcased it on the podcast before <laughs> no i don't think we ever have <laughs> i'm surprised yeah, again, the the things that I was referencing were like a novel I had read um, called Gun with Occasional Music. Um, and where there's like these, it's a weird um, noir detective story, but there's also people who are like half animal. So like my, 
it's not even like I had a incredibly original concept. It was more right, like the thing references I was drawing from weren't other yeah. brick films per se, exactly. right? So um, I was just trying to do something that was this kind of like fantasy noir story and um you know the fabuland characters i think i ordered specifically because i just discovered that fabuland existed because this again was like uh, at a point where like even knowing the history of lego before i was born mm -hmm. was hard you had to like there weren't explainers on youtube because youtube didn't exist but there <laughs> were like things and i was like oh my gosh these things are super cool and so i ordered a bunch of them specifically to make that so i i didn't like have fabuland but i uh had had read that book and then i was, had like found that and that's like okay that's and then you know uh my favorite movies of the time were like you know fight club donnie darko david fincher type of stuff so i wanted it to have that kind of feel so like the influences are pretty straightforward they're just not what you know it, it had nothing very little of it was like driven by lego or brick filming standards it was just what i was consuming at mm -hmm. the time it's kind of interesting that like we would end up getting a another kind of um fabuland based mystery brick film kind of well, series come out of like the, uh, I don't know if many people would know this person anymore, but uh, they're called like Th Thayuka Films, and they're like a, a, an Estonian, Thauka films, yeah, an yeah, Estonian um, brick filmer who um, made a bunch of Fabuland um, like mystery brick films, um, and they were kind of like uh, sort of riddle based. Um, they're kind of like short videos, um, but they're like yeah, these like riddle based brick films with uh, Fabuland figures. Um, it was like something the of the rose or the red room or i i yeah. I, I remember watching some of them um back in the day but yeah no it it was of the very few <laughs> fabuland <laughs> featuring brick films it's interesting that two of them have this uh detective kind of uh genre vibe yeah. another thing i think is interesting about um you mentioning that people weren't really making the type of brick films you wanted to is that like i feel like the vast majority of people in the community back then didn't approach brick filming from the standpoint of like actually being fans of Lego or like into brick construction and like set design and use of, you know, colors and like specific interesting Lego pieces. Like, you know, the Frankie job and 19 is at nine still just just leap out greatly in, you know, in the sort of brick film canon in, in the way it uses all of that, I think. Right, just like color mm. choice and, you know, uh, NPU, as some people <laughs> used to say, nice part use. Um, the the appeal, I think, largely of, of uh, like, your, your brick films, um, looking at also the Frankie job, but also, like, Night News Line particularly, is um, how kind of 90s the, uh, the Lego is. <laughs> and it's very much like the kind of Lego that you would have had as a kid. Um, and th it has a very specific aesthetic to it. Um, partly it is the it is those kind of very kind of vibrant um, you know kind of classic Lego colors um, but also it's like yeah the, the kind of you know the part usage the the type of type of Lego that you have the even the minifigures um, I I can tell that like uh, you, you know mentioning um, the um, Dragon Masters I mean I, I'm assuming that's where the green dragon comes from <laughs> yeah no and also <laughs> like Malefios's face. Mm -hmm comes from that set right like that set uh, i looked back and was like oh it's kind of interesting that uh yeah dragons and this evil sneaky face uh have been in like i mean robophilia also originated in a totally random like another one of my friends actually created robophilia like and uh i then just like and would just put her in the background of random things i was filming in these hour-long videos which i called with the very memorable titles lego movie 2 and lego movie 2 volume 1 <laughs> or something like that <laughs> like uh anyway fall and tomato stuff but yeah so like i didn't even and then you know she was just so much fun to like her whole vibe was actually somebody else's kind of creation and i just like kept it so i i just kind of uh but yeah i mean so much of what my films were was based on my collection which was what i had growing up as a kid and also my older siblings so it veered a little into like 
uh, late 70s, early 80s stuff as well. And um, I've said this many, many places, but the, I think it's Lego Idea Book, I forget if it's number 3000 or 7000, like is the Bill and Mary Idea Book. I, literally, I stole the whole concept and aesthetic for Phil and Sherry from Bill and Mary. <laughs> like it is very much influenced by Lego and Lego kind of themes and color palettes and designs. Um, so, you know, it's... I do think it's very funny yeah. that you, you yeah, created Lego Movie 2, uh, you know, in t- 2004, way before Lego Movie 2 came out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I do but, think Malithios's face is the, uh, the greatest Lego villain face of all time. <laughs> oh, ab- without a doubt, yeah. <laughs> Those yeah, those older Lego faces have so much more character and like sort of a cartoony art style that I think suits a lot better than a lot of the newer faces. I, I do love to sort of keep the minifigure parts around that era. Yeah, no, it's 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 a really interesting. Um, I mean, like I, I think it's also going to show up in a lot of the films we're looking at today, yeah. right? That like uh, they're they're very much of that kind of era of Lego design. Yeah, this is the the vibe of. I feel, yeah, I feel like when people use those parts, they have a certain vibe to their films and the way the characters move and speak, and it it's just kind of it's quite Lego-y, I think. <laughs> yeah, there's a pure Legoness to that to that era. I feel like it just feels like it's attached to that, and it's kind of uh, reflected in in you know a lot of the films that that uh, use those kind of pieces. <laughs> yeah, basically, I think that nineteen is a nine is like as I said, some of the, the best use of the medium and some of the stuff that's like held up the best in my own mind um, in brick filming. It's, it's, to me, it's interesting to sort of observe how I feel about um, things that I've seen, uh, you know, I saw back when they were new and I st- still see them now, but I put them on the wiki and stuff. Um, it, it, it does take a long time f- for me to really sort out like, yes, I think this one holds up. I think you know, something else maybe doesn't hold up as well. Um, but yeah, to I think of 1989 as like pretty timeless and more like more like genuine art <laughs> than <laughs> than a lot of other brick films. Oh yeah, for sure. Uh, it, yeah, I mean, like um, I think also right. I I I always want to point out that like I was at a very unique historical advantage. In that, like, I was just a little bit mm-hmm. older than a lot of people who were brick filming, right? Like, I came in at a very... So it was easier for me to stand out just because, like, I literally was, like, having college-age students review my scripts, mm. which was not a luxury most other brick filmers who were prolific at that time or even, you know, making anything at that time did because just it was more likely they were, like, somebody with a webcam, like and was maybe in middle school or high school, you know, without necessarily access to like a creative community that was supporting them. Right. So like, I think, uh, I, anyway, just want to call out my own privilege in, in the fact that like, because I was doing this, I didn't stop, uh, as when I was a young teenager and I continued doing it into college when basically nobody else unless you had the same exact childhood as me, which is what David Pagano had. <laughs> like, we're, we're literally, <laughs> like, weird twins across the country, um, you know, and a few other people. Uh, it was just, right, like, we had a level of, you know, just adult yeah. sophistication in our tastes that wasn't going to be reflected by most things that were being made. But, I mean, like, you know, it's like the magic portal, right? Like, that, you know, it just... it. It is and such an incredible piece of work, um, but like so many things had to ha- happen for that to exist in a way that, you know, today there's just such a lower barrier to access that there's just going to be so much more and 99% of everything is bad. <laughs> um, so like, anyway, sorry, I'm going on tangents about art. Yeah. Philosophy. <laughs> I'm going to stop talking. Yeah, I, I think that, yeah, like... I, I probably said, again, I might have said this on the, the previous podcast where we talked about 19 Days at 9, but like, you know, when I was younger watching it, when it was coming out, um, when I was like, I don't know, 13 or something, um, I obviously I recognized it as great. Like, I loved the, the series, but I wouldn't have sort of consciously picked up on things I can now. Like, I, I can rewatch it now and I can I can see that. I can see like, oh, yeah, you know, 
there's more like intentional sort of taste and decisions and thoughts going in going on here than than a lot of the victims by slightly younger people at the time yeah i mean you know i feel i feel like there's, there's so much that there's so much that can be read into like stuff like the whole kind of the 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 orange versus green kind of war that is, that is going on and 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 the way in which mm-hmm. like the, the you know doing it from the perspective of, like a news station where like they have a specific um kind of viewpoint on that <laughs> uh, and, and you know like Malifio's taking over the sports section and saying whatever he wants to say broadcasting his <laughs> his opinions about sport um yeah uh, and i think those kind of things are like you, you you read it in a different context as an adult i think i feel like <laughs> yeah yeah i mean also just the stuff that happened um, immediately after I made Nightly Leaders and Nine, like <laughs> Facebook <laughs> becoming mm-hmm. a thing, right? Like, just happened to like give resonance to what I was doing there um, in a different way. That like, what has happened to journalism oh. um, since Nightly News was created? Like, that's another reason why I, I can't even like, you know, conceive of what Chapter Three would be at this <laughs> point because it's like, you know our whole concept of what it means to do TV journalism has shifted so much from when I started writing that in 2006, right? Like it's, it would just, I don't know how I would do that without addressing like the world, (laughs) Uh, which is just hard, right? Because like one of the things that then, then if I'm more reactive to how things have changed, does that make it less, timeless yeah. or more i don't know but that's that's why i think yeah. it's great is that it, it it does feel timeless and it can speak to things in the real world but also that could essentially all go over your head <laughs> especially if you're young um it's it's not in your face it's not it's not just trying to say something else and using this sort of lego mask like at the end of the day it is just a great brick film series as well and to me that's kind of like a great sort of ideal it's, it's something i would like to aim for if if i was to ever make a major major project again yeah. <laughs> who knows if that'll ever happen that's something i definitely yeah. take notes on you know with with the uh the prospect of well currently making a, a huge project and then uh you know after i've made this huge project make a absolutely massive project um I mean, i'm sure it's something which uh, you can relate to <laughs> yeah when um david mckenna Pagano and I finished the Lego animation book and and then finished the Magic Picnic, which did not perfectly coincide with the end of the release of the Lego animation book. We were like, no new projects, right? We're going to keep each other accountable. No <laughs> projects ever again. <laughs> like We're done. Uh, or just, you know, like trying to be really careful before mm-hmm. jumping to the next one. But he actually had to do Little Guys yeah. in Space, so he was already on the hook <laughs> anyway. Uh, actually... I guess we ought to ask, how did you first come into contact with David Pagano? Yeah, it was um, Brick World Chicago 2009. I mean, there were maybe a couple other Lego animators there, but, you know, mostly the the adults who kind of attended those things were, you know, Lego fans who just built things or just wanted to be there, not people who made movies. So, um, you know, it was we found each other very quickly and I had seen uh, what would uh, little guys. Cause that had come out at that point. Um, and he had seen the Frankie job and we we're like, Oh, Hey, you're the, <laughs> the guy. And then we just started hanging out. Um, and I forget if it was t- 2008, maybe we, it's been a long time, but like one year we just kind of saw each other and like waved. And then like the next year we like hung out together the whole conference. And then that just started being, an annual thing and then you know uh when i would go to new york i i would visit him and vice versa when he came to chicago so um and then yeah at that point um we were both trying to sell our animated lego films on individual dvds and people would be like oh does this show you how to make lego movies and we're like no mm. it's an original creation <laughs> and people would be like oh okay and I'm like okay so we just need to make the thing that tells people how to make films mm-hmm. And so we did. That's an interesting backstory to the Lego animation book. Yeah, it was so people would stop asking <laughs> us questions. And that, that, it, it, yeah. It's all here. Buy the book. It also kind of reminds me of the How to Build series. Like, it's based on sort of viewer feedback. Yeah, yeah 
no, I mean, again, like these are the, if you want to actually run an effective business, like understanding what the customer wants is really important. And that's not the same as creating art per se. And, you know, that's like attention that goes into every single creative industry, not just brick filming or, you know, YouTubing. Like that's, that's at the heart of Hollywood novels, all the stuff is like, what, what is there a market demand for versus like, what is, you know, the thing you have in your heart. Yeah. So. There is that classic kind of um, phrase. I, I I hear it kind of being said quite, you know, quite a bit about, especially like um, film directors who, uh, who, who will make like a big Hollywood film, but then, you know, make something for themselves. Like, you know, the, yeah. Is it make, making a film for the industry versus making a film for yourself kind of thing. Like, I guess it's kind of similar with like, you know, YouTube and, and, uh, and that side of things, as this case is like any industry, I guess. <laughs> yeah, and you know, I really wanted to have making Lego movies, Lego video content, uh, my full time job. Right, that just seemed like the best possible <laughs> scenario for me, and I did it. I, I made it happen, and I did whatever I needed to to make that happen, really. And it worked for a couple years until you know, yada yada, else apocalypse. <laughs> Um, and, uh, I'm glad I did and had that experience, but, um, running a, a creative business is really hard. Uh, it's, you know, I don't think it's ever been easy. Right. Um, and, uh, there are just like inherent conflicts in it and, you know, wanting to make art is one thing and wanting to run a business is another. And, I'm I'm really glad now that I know exactly what it entails. And I'm like, you know what? I'm good. I'm just going to have a regular day job that pays me well and then have free time to maybe do projects that I'm interested in and not have to worry about, you know, the viability of them as content that makes me money because that's, it's a whole different you yeah. know, set of <laughs> requirements to try and fit in. And it's really hard to like find the way i do think i can i can somewhat relate having done a, a video for the lego group recently and i do have that feeling of like well i'm i'm happy i got to i got the experience and um, it was a nice opportunity but i don't think i'd be interested in it being a sort of ongoing for the rest of my life like you know having to hit these sort of deadlines and crunch um with you know what was what was supposed to be a like creative like hobby thing. Yeah, I mean, I feel like um, you know D D Dave Pagano had a had a kind of interesting perspective on that. Like when we were talking to him about like you know ma making um, making the videos that he was making, um, and well, I, I mean you know a you know a big side of it is kind of not having like the entire sort of creative control. On certain projects, and and what he was saying basically was like, you know, was it still kind of like his film? Was it kind of done in the style that he would want to make it in? Um, does it fit mm. into like the kind of philosophy of, of of Lego that like he kind of enjoys, or is it you know not that you know? And um, I guess that that can be extended to you know any kind of sort of project like that you know outside Lego as well. It's it's kind of a thing of you know do do you kind of want to exclusively work on projects which are like not your own projects or you know do you want to have the chance to do something that you creatively is your you know your project and, and speaks to like you as a as a i guess an artist really you know yeah and i mean there's there's lots of different ways to find a balance that works for you as like a creative professional like i did a lot of um video production work that was client driven but not lego based um when i first started my career and it was like it was just good because i was producing videos for people so i was spending time and getting paid making videos so it just made me a better editor made me a better like producer all those kind of things even if it was we're recording a lecture at the university right it's not my artistic dream, but it like it was a paycheck and it helped me build a skill set. So, you know, I think there's uh, and whatever the current creative job market is, is ever shifting. But, you know, trying to find ways that you can, you know, do something you enjoy uh, that also builds like a skill set you want to use for your art is different than saying, I want to make money with my art and 
only that because that it, it yeah the, the opportunities to do that are very 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 rare so i think it was funny um am i right in remembering that pagana was speaking about the space police series on the podcast before um and like maybe having some misgivings with um like the portrayal of the police versus the <laughs> aliens in the line, which I've, I've seen like other people comment on in more recent yeah, years I mean, he, online. I, I remember well. him saying that, like, you know, he, he did get yeah. like comments from people being like, you know, why did you make this sort of decision? And then him having to kind of basically kind of explain that, like, that that wasn't oh, yeah. his decision. That's what Lego <laughs> like told him to do or asked him to do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I, I again, since I, I know David Pagano pretty well, like we talked through a lot of his, you know, challenges and struggles during that period like he got like he was doing videos for the lego group like for a good chunk of years like that was his main thing but um you know depending on who he was working with like they may or may not have been open to like helpful feedback on like hey this idea you pitched is literally going to be impossible for me to do within the budget so we need to have <laughs> something else here in the script versus okay i'll try to do that it's not gonna work but uh and like um oh. what is it country building is one of the best examples of where they're like we just need some sort of music video like here's like the audio i think and then he just like kind of did his thing and so it's like one of the rare examples where it's like this is a pagano film like mm, through and absolutely, through yeah. right like the scale that mm, he's through and through building yeah. out all of that like and it was just because he had a lot more creative input on that versus you know being handed a script so there, there were definitely different projects that allowed him to kind of bring his um you know brick filming style which again is is still really unique and distinct right like um like the, the the size at which mm -hmm. he built characters um two different sizes right like <laughs> kind of yeah. um set as standards <laughs> that still very other few other people have used but um yeah, yeah i think that's like something that like uh, i've probably mentioned i probably said this before when in uh, in the actual uh, episode but um the, yeah i think that the the, the what really like, makes country building stand out so much is that it it absolutely like first and foremost is a pagano film at least that's kind of how i feel about it um you know like uh, it's it's kind of a it's a it's a kind of yeah. a, a video for lego seconds rather than you know and i i i've had some of my own struggles with being asked to do things that are impossible and like half the time i have to say no that's impossible and the other half of the time i'm like okay i'll try and then when i when i am trying i'm thinking to myself i shouldn't have told them <laughs> i'll try this this is impossible yeah. <laughs> yeah requests from people who aren't the actual hands-on animators so they you know don't know what it's going to entail and that's the thing that's that difficult. that's the interesting thing about like you know working with um working with clients is that like i think you know one half uh the time like they're they're very much kind of hands off and they just sort of trust you to be like well yeah we, we kind of want this and this um we trust you to kind of come up with like how you're going to do this you know good luck um and then the other side of it is kind of like having a specific idea but like not really being aware of like what is it isn't possible um and you know how it, you know how you try and navigate the difficulties of like how how do you actually do this <laughs> yeah mm -hmm. But my thought about Space Police, um, I was going to go on to sort of contrast that with the um, police show commercial, the <laughs> 1989 film. Because, like, I, I guess I would have seen that in, when it was new. And basically, you know, to to my mind at the time, be like, yeah, it's it's a it's a nice brick film. It has nice builds. It's, you know, a enjoyable brick film and all that. But now I can watch it now and think, oh, yeah, it's a, you know, a parody of propaganda TV shows. And it has, like, rather... <laughs> clear commentary yeah no i mean like it. the the one robot literally says that they are skilled in torture right like uh, <laughs> um but you know <laughs> that line does not really flag uh to you know somebody who's just the general audience who's watching burke films which like is children right which is 
one of the yeah. things that I think we don't like mm -hmm. to admit in the brick film community is that like <laughs> our uh, primary audience is always going to be kids, right? It's not going to be people who are the age we are generally uh, when we're making these films at a yeah. high technical quality. It's probably going to be, uh, I mean, there's exceptions, obviously, like, and the Lego movie has changed some of that, but um, yeah, like, so yeah, like doing the, like committing to the commentary I did without any expectation of anyone watching it, getting it, is, is kind of a crazy thing, but <laughs> you know, I'm glad I did, if only for your edification on rewatch, so you're welcome. I mean, I, yeah. I, I want to say that... 10 I, to I, 15 years later, somebody will say, oh, hey, I noticed that. <laughs> I, I, I shared... I, I, I want to say that I shared the same kind of experience that um, Sean did in terms of re-watching re -watching, um, Cop Show um, uh, today and, and kind of um, coming out of it with a different kind of perspective than when I had first watched it. It's interesting because it, it does kind of touch on something which um, I find kind of interesting in terms of, like... I don't know, so, sometimes when you you want to add something to a brick film that actually has kind of a mean you know an actual meaning to it like outside of just like the it's a lego video kind of i don't know aspect I, I do kind of wonder do you do you kind of come out of it thinking like if even if you're like if you're like the only person who's actively going to kind of know or pick up on like what's being said that 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 in itself is you know uh in some way satisfactory because that's something I think about quite a lot in terms of wanting to, to I mean, you, you know, you can say about art in general, wanting to kind of like a apply certain things to a to a work of art. Yeah. Um, I, I, so yeah, I, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the video game Tunic um, came out a couple of years ago or the game Animal Well. Um, these are games that are deeply about secrets, like like secrets within secrets within secrets. Like you have to think of ridiculous things to do to find some of the deepest hidden secrets in these video games and i was watching a game developers conference talk about one of them and they had this phrase content for no one like things that they're like we literally have no expectation that anyone will ever figure out this thing that we hid deeply in the work um people actually did but right <laughs> like this this approach that you know because so much of what you do when you create, again, creating like a creative product is you want to like gear it towards like the general audience because that's your largest audience. But how do you balance, right? Putting in the stuff for, you know, the really devoted fans, like the, the balance of kind of breadth and depth that you can do in something like um, the Barbie movie, for instance, I think is a really great example where, there is a lot of incredibly niche references that are just for Barbie fans about like specific outfits and all this kind of stuff. Uh, but you also don't need to know that much about Barbie to go in and watch that. Um, like, uh, obviously this is a Lego podcast, but you know, it's one of the only other like toy movies that I think has anything to say. Um, and I think it has more to say than the Lego movie because mm -hmm. anyway, that's again, something we should not mm -hmm. talk about. Because I could go on for hours. <laughs> no, that's, that is oh, interesting. Yeah. But yeah, I, I think it's something that, like, I, I mean, I'm always kind of aware of the the prospect of of making something with with not like a huge audience actually seeing it, um, but still having some level of satisfaction in it being created. I don't know. Like, that's something that I think about quite a lot because, I mean. In a large extent, that is kind of how I started out, and how like most of us started out, is uh, we basically made things for ourselves. Um, like, uh, yeah, I mean, your, your early brick films, I guess, like, you know, when you were first starting out, I mean, that was probably mostly for yourself, right? Like, you know, if we can connect to the the part of ourselves that started, you know, making brick films, and maybe, maybe that that can give us the motivation to kind of continue. Even if it's not for a hugely wide audience. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, and I think also there's lots of reasons people brick film, right? Like for me, it is not just about animating. It is also about, you know, creating a world, telling a story. And not every brick filmer is interested in every aspect of like, you know, animation in that way of 
doing all of the things. They might be less interested in script and character work and more interested in fight sequences, right? Or like whatever it is. So, you know, recognizing what you're actually interested in and focusing on that and um, cultivating that as opposed to putting in a walk cycle because it's a brick film, right? Yeah. Right, yeah. <laughs> I think walk cycles have become one of our own pet peeves. <laughs> like <laughs> that piece of advice that we're always trying to tell people is like cut out that walking. <laughs> Stop walking. We're an anti uh, anti walking podcast. I've never said that before. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's yeah, it, yeah. but it's kind of. I was also reminded you were talking about like sort of, sort of being unspoken that like the biggest audience for brick films is kids. It it's funny. It makes me think of on on the Bricks Emotion Discord, you know, like on Discord, we're supposed to ban people if we discover that they're under 13, which, of course, is, again, connected to the like COPPA thing. Yeah, we, we are occasionally banning people if if they say they're 12 or 11 or something. But, it, you know, we're always thinking, just just don't mention the fact that all of us who are doing the banning, we all joined the community when we were 10, 11, 12. <laughs> <laughs> That's unless, and that's unless you're like me and didn't have internet until you left, they were 15. But, yeah. <laughs> I absolutely would have been, like you know, nine years old if it, and on on, on brick filming if 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 I had the internet. So I'd, I'd definitely say that. <laughs> I think to us it, it it feels like the audience isn't mostly kids because all the feedback we get is from other brick filmers. Um, True. I don't know if it would have been different when you were releasing Nightly News at Nine and How to Build. Like maybe it would have been more apparent that um, there was a lot of kids watching. Um, I mean, like. It's again, it wasn't necessarily where I started in how I conceived of my audience. Um, but it's something like, especially as I focused on making YouTube uh, profitable for me, uh, like understanding who like my fan base, audience base that, you know, would watch videos and how to hone in on that. Like it became very clear that it was like, yeah, most of these are people who should not technically be leaving comments <laughs> like right but it was this open <laughs> secret that everybody kind of understood yeah. that kids are on youtube <laughs> and nobody uses the youtube kids app even once that existed um that uh it, it was very awkward and like I, I you know i had my own dark nights of the soul about like my audience and how i interacted with them and trying to like make sure i didn't do anything that would, you know, take advantage of like the the power differential there, right? Of like uh, age and things like that, mm -hmm. and so tried to be very uh, good about not really interacting with fans in any sort of private way, right? Only doing it like at a public trade show where if they come up with their parents and talk to me, like sure, whatever, but not messaging with people uh, aside from responding to comments, right? Like that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, yeah, it was it was always this sort of awkward thing, you know, brick filming is it's like it skews a little bit older than, you know, like people first building with Lego. It's definitely like it's not five year olds. It's more like eight year olds to like teenagers. So <laughs> it's this kind of tween zone where like it's kind of like, well, we have these these rules and regulations, but like a, a, a given 12 year old can be. More sophisticated than a given thirteen-year-old, right? Like it's um, so like you don't want to exclude people who are enjoying it uh, and like doing so properly. But like, yeah, it was super. Uh, I'm so glad I don't have to think about that stuff anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I will say, uh, actually, from from my own experience, um, I've been doing um, recently um, a series of um, uh, Lego uh, brick, brick film workshops with 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 kids. Um, which has been a like really like uh, interesting experience because I'm actually I'm actually kind of ex you know sort of like getting first hand experience of, of like um, how perceptive um, kids at a certain age are with like you know what you know when it comes to like break filming and stuff like that um, and um, you know the, the the age group generally uh, that I've worked with is probably around like seven eight nine um, but you know it does vary quite a bit um, and it's interesting because you know the there was like a couple of kids that, that have been to some of the workshops where like they've already kind of made brick films um and they mm. they know how to do stuff like you know quick i don't know 
edit a basic sequence and have titles and and you know this kind of stuff and but it's 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 very interesting because like you know obviously that's not going to be uh, the case with like every kind of like nine year olds you know <laughs> i it's very strange to have gone from being a kid with you know sort of unfiltered internet access all day every day to now like seeing kids on the internet and be like what this is this is weird you know there there shouldn't be kids here you know like like kids on the internet there's, there's so much so many people pushing narratives and stuff like their brains are going to be fried <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's like I, I i guess i thought i thought i never thought i'd be like i'd be the one thinking that <laughs> <laughs> yeah but it's, it, it is interesting cuz like you know, I think you you kind of grew up with a perspective of a very you know very different internet really. Um, like the internet in like that's you know, true. Two thousand eight, two thousand nine is is very different to like what we'd have today. And I think that, um, you know, for for better or worse, I think mostly for for the better. Um, we're a lot more kind of aware of that. Like, you know, kids shouldn't be in certain places on the internet. Um, and well, arguably, should they be on the internet at all? Is you know something which <laughs> I, I do question. Um, but it it is interesting. I think that like, yeah, I don't know that you you come from that perspective of kind of like an you know an era of, of of the internet where like you were able to freely navigate these things. But that kind of led to a lot of the reasons why we have these regulations now. <laughs> should we talk about some brick phones? <laughs> yeah true <laughs> yeah That's i mean actually idea, yeah do, do we do we want to actually talk about the showcase uh, yeah i think we're good to go to the showcase brick films yeah cool yeah so for anyone who's uh, new to the podcast the showcase is an opportunity for each of us to talk about a brick film that um either means a lot to us or that we want to kind of showcase in general um and in this episode i think we've all kind of picked sort of things which i feel like are kind of relevant to uh, things like Nine News and Nine and that kind of sensibility. Um, I picked um, an episode of Mini Life TV, um, which is by um, Chris Eliasis, um and um, his friend Ian. Um, and uh, yeah, I picked um, episode 65, uh, Super Mini Bros, um, which I felt was kind of like a, a fitting uh, kind of pick because it's obviously inspired by Mario and it's also uh, Mini Life TV, which is... Uh, very much uh, inspired by, um, well, you know, creating creating its own kind of world, which I feel like is very much inspired by like Night News and Nine, uh, and also there is actual an actual connection between uh, both series as well. With like, I think Malifios and um, a couple of other characters have actually appeared in uh, in Mini Life TV. Yeah, as well. I mean, um, Mini Life TV, like when it was first starting, Chris uh, messaged me. I forget if it was like through YouTube or email, and you know talked about you know how he was a huge fan of nightly news nine and influenced and then we worked on some specific things where i voiced characters um like on his show in his world as well as bringing in nightly news at nine characters and he would ask me like is it okay if i reference you know the fictional planet you made up i was like yes please like please uh you have and you know mini life tv <laughs> has way more episodes and content than nightly news at at nine ever did so it's kind of funny to think about um you know he he, he very much like <laughs> took the idea i uh tried to do and took it a lot further than i ever did in terms of like you know just the number of videos and the amount of content that exists yeah absolutely and, I, and it's um yeah i think it's interesting that like you know because clearly i feel like it's, it's it's one of those things where i you know, I, I'm sure that, that Chris would would uh, would agree absolutely that like, you know, uh, Me Love TV wouldn't have existed without um, uh, Night News at Nine. Um, but I feel like he he managed to create his own kind of world that, you know, has a lot of kind of like, you know, characters and backstory and 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 just like you know, it just it, it operates in its own kind of way. Um, very much kind of like you know uh, Night News and I did, but like it also has its its own identity. That's it's you know its own. Um, which um, yeah is is really cool to see. Um, I, I particularly like this episode because you know it has like uh, that kind of I guess Mario kind of reference. There's, there's some really cool kind of sequences where it's you know kind of taking influence from um, you know sort of Super Mario Bros. Uh, which is kind of I, I felt like you you'd appreciate. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Yeah, no, I mean, I think um, what what's really great about mini life TV is in some ways it started out a lot more episodic um, than Nightly News at Nine did. Uh, you know, later seasons, they definitely did like really big arcs um, and stuff like that. But that any random episode of mini life TV could just have kind of any focus or topic like they go to see a Batman movie in one right um, this episode um, so I think he did a better job of actually sticking to like one of the premises I had when I was thinking about and I lose and I was like oh I can just do a short video on whatever uh, and mini life TV really did that uh, especially at the beginning a lot better of just doing all sorts of random things and not worrying, but then built its own mythology based on a lot of those things. And this is like a great example of, you can watch this video without knowing a lot and still appreciate all the Mario references maybe without knowing much else about the characters because um, that is not like core, but you know, obviously you also learn more about the world every time you watch any mini life TV episode. So I think they, they Chris, does that kind of um, world building and individual like episode com completeness really well? Absolutely, and I think like one thing I really like about I mean live TV is that um, you know I mean I know that uh, Chris you know said this, you know himself like uh, when he was on the podcast that like he kind of feels like he can basically do whatever he wants in real live TV where like he doesn't really need to make like uh, uh, any you know a brick film that isn't in live TV. Um, <laughs> You know, like it can, it can be whatever he wants it to be, um, and and uh, that's something I really like about it. Like how how kind of like you know he he just kind of is creating this world as it as it's kind of as he's going and and kind of is able to make whatever he wants to make. Like it can be a kind of a comedic kind of goofy kind of video, or it can be something that is kind of um, you know that has you know has like arcs and and has like you know want to touch on something that's more serious you know and it's 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 all done within that same world yeah and it's all very colorful and creative and again sort of lego-y wi without even it doesn't lean into like oh hey we're made of lego or anything but it still feels lego-y <laughs> I, I think there's something about that like i i do appreciate as well like having a tone which feels like it is confident in, in, enough in itself to not be like constantly making lego references <laughs> with yeah. some with some kind of i feel like some um like more like self-aware kind of brick films sometimes uh suffer from a little bit with just being like too self-referential if if that's like the only bit that they have yeah yeah i, yeah, I think it can work within uh, yeah. a certain I mean, context it's yeah. definitely like a lego universe right like they're on a planet called legando um and they do things that you know lego mm -hmm. characters can do like swapping out body parts and that so it is what one of i think again it's successful because it's like aware of its medium and uses that to its advantage as opposed to you know mm -hmm. one thing that you know what I always felt like were insufferable brick films where like people are trying to tell like a dramatic story in spite mm. of the fact that they're using like a children's <laughs> toy and like you can do it, but like yeah. sometimes like this, the self seriosity of brick films, I'm like, what, why? It feels like you're just doing this story that you want to tell in Lego because that's the only thing that you have the, skills to do and like you would rather do this with human actors you just don't have the budget and access to do that i don't know so i mm -hmm. always appreciate about that about mini life that yeah. it's like something it's happy to be made of lego yeah true yeah that, that sort of thing i guess it's just something you kind of pick up on when you get a bit older but yeah it's something that we've talked about on the podcast a bunch is sort of like entirely completely self-serious brick films and just if they're so serious about it it just can come across silly to like if you're unless you're like 13 i guess that's one of the litmus tests is that like of are you are you over the age of 13 uh, what kind of brick films do you like are they like super <laughs> deep uh, drama ones or <laughs> yeah even though like a lot of the classic brick films and brick films that i love they are you know pretty serious enough but there's just there's some that i feel like cross a line as far as being like so self-serious and unself-aware about it yeah i mean there's, there's particular ones that, that come to mind um i don't really like to kind of you know talk to sort of mention them like in a in a nicer context but 
Um, but yeah, I don't know. I think that um, it, it's yeah, it's interesting trying to sort of toy that line of what what, what is kind of when is it going too far? Because I think there are, there are instances where you can make you know serious book films. I um, I feel like we like to speak on the podcast with people and like sometimes they they say things and we're sort of thinking like yes somebody else gets it you know it's it's different <laughs> to like the sort of things that that we're like rolling our eyes at in rig filming on a like you know daily basis <laughs> <laughs> yeah um i just want to call out a couple things about this uh, about mini life this episode just looking through it like scanning really quick it's the color is so vibrant so saturated right like um yeah so like some of that comes down to set design um and right like the world design like even that opening intro sequence like this is a a video a show that is not afraid of color that embraces the colorful nature of of that and like again that's one of those things where rather than fighting a medium it's like it's taking the energy that's already there and using it um and it just then you don't have to deal with like the cognitive dissonance of like the aesthetics not matching the tone um because like you you can like mm-hmm. do an all gray brick film like robata of course is like a great example of like mm. it, it's it's ultimately a silly story at some level but it's got like a really great vibe and tone because it commits to a different kind of lego aesthetic yeah. um versus the you know mini life tv really caters to the minifig lego system lego land uh kind of aesthetic as opposed to you know um other lego aesthetics that are possible yeah yeah robota certainly is a great sort of rare example yeah i think there is something you know there's a context there with obviously with robota that like it's it's so it's so kind of removed from the kind of standard kind of uh you know scale um and everything but it's able to do stuff in a not in a in a way which kind of like I don't know in a, in a non brick film way, <laughs> but it's it's still you know it, it, yeah it's still a brick film, <laughs> um, but yeah I know what you mean I think that with with um, with Life TV it's it's the aesthetics and the color um, is maybe another kind of maybe I don't know like I don't know if it's even like a, a, um, a subconscious influence but it, it does feel like there's something akin to like um uh, 19 news at nine as well you know it has that same kind of energy absolutely i mean there's a reason i like it it's like <laughs> the, we're definitely like have similar aesthetic vibes you know I, l- watching this though i'm also noticing chris was really good about in this not over complicating his set design like most of these mario shots are literally just like you know him shooting against a piece of colored paper and like a little bit of lego and a bunch of stuff added in digitally Mm -hmm. right like in turn like i would have done all of that practically and that's one of the reasons nightly news at nine did not have a consistent (laughs) release schedule because like i was so dedicated to doing everything in camera that like (laughs) i wouldn't even have thought to do some of these things the way he did it Mm -hmm. and you know i think that it's like it's one of those production choices that then really changes again to the extent that you know you're trying to meet the demands of the YouTube content machine, um, Mini Life TV I think was way more successful at that because he was really good at like ha- uh, preventing scope creep, <laughs> um, which I was terrible at. Like I just all the scope crept in everything. Yeah, and I do think that he has always been rather tasteful, like has a cohesive style with the like digital layers of things, digital effects. It, it's, it doesn't just feel like, you know, oh, you just slapped it on there in an editing program and called it a day. And especially more recent ones as well. Like, it's, you make use of sort of like anime inspired, like flat, flat digital things and characters sort of flying in as, you know, as a, a different layer. But it's just really well put together, I think. I just noticed this is doing like real, um, like physical voice lip syncing Mm -hmm. which is ridiculous right (laughs) like i think he later moved to digital but this was like a specific era in which he uh like actually had multiple printed faces Mm -hmm. of the characters to do some of that or maybe it's just well blended i don't know i can't really tell some shots it looks one way and the other 
Um, but I think he did actually, he was one of the few people to really do like practical lip sync, like actually having uh, with, and like somehow got multiple printed heads mm -hmm. with different face shapes, right? Like as opposed to taping on a piece of paper, which is also a great way to do it. But like, again, there's, there's, there's a way in which like the technical capability of even like a basic mini life TV episode is elevated above what you might be used to in other Brick films. Mm -hmm. And certainly having to swap the head out for every frame, it, that seems too, too tedious for me, I think. <laughs> yeah, I'd much rather do it digitally, I'd say. Um, which obviously he, yeah. he, he, ultimately he did in the end, but uh, yeah. <laughs> I get maybe... I, did did he say on the podcast before that yeah basically it was just too too much um tedious work possibly yeah <laughs> it's hard to say i mean it was that was like four years Which, ago yeah. we spoke to him now yeah you know <laughs> when i see it now in this i am thinking like oh my god i can't imagine committing to that <laughs> yeah yeah but like you can tell right like because like i'm i'm just slow watching at like 37 seconds in when one person's painting and like their head is slightly bobbing mm -hmm. or like swiveling every frame so it's like no that's literally that was a practical effect yeah. and like i don't know i really love the um the bumps oh, yeah. of stop motion um you know it's why pagano and i named our uh you know blog the set bump mm -hmm. um because it is such an inherent part of the physicality of uh stop motion so um i don't know I, that's one of the reasons I never worried too much about like stuff randomly breaking or moving in the background of my shot, because it's like, it's stop motion. Like that's part yeah. of it. So, you know, I, I get that. Like, what was it? Leica, the one that does like the actual Hollywood, like they're basically 3d movies that then have just been digitally pr printed. physically printed <laughs> and you can't tell, but it's like, I, that's not my yeah. aesthetic. That bothers yeah. me. The like a perfectionism. But, you know, it gets to a point where it's kind of like almost ashamed of being stop motion. Like it wants to hide the, its identity in mm -hmm. a way. And yeah, I agree that I do. I do like to see that their heads and their hats slightly bump every frame. Like, yeah, it's it's real. <laughs> that is really funny because like, I think there would have been a point in time where like I would have would have seen that and thought like, oh, that's that like an, an imperfection. Yeah. Whereas like it, it is kind of um there's something interesting about the idea of like pairing something that is very tedious and complicated, like replacing the face with every frame, but then also having it be kind of like a physical thing that you can see <laughs> happening. Um, and I don't know, there's a, there's a real charm to that. I think you know it, it keeps its kind of humanity. <laughs> yeah, and I, I certainly I certainly hope that there's still a, a demand for you know the the realness. Especially with with the rise of like CG Rick films and also uh, the potential threat of AI, <laughs> <laughs> I I, I want to see the the real stuff. But uh, should we talk about the the next showcase Brick film? Yeah, yeah, sure. Is that your pick, Sean? Oh, okay, yeah. So, uh, well, usually we don't pick a a pretty new release, but this time I decided I would go for something from Rick Film Day this year, which is uh, Blandir's film A Family Affair. Uh, which is eight minutes long and it, I think that like basically this film it's in that it's in a sort of style that we've basically been talking about throughout this podcast which is very much leaning into the Lego-ness and kind of the the goofiness and also it's being made by somebody who is old enough to have taste and to have elements that contribute to like a distinct style like in the music choices and how things look and how they move and such where it's like you know it doesn't have to have the the smoothest animation or it doesn't have to have the, the most like incredible set design but it just has this sort of vibe and this energy to it and a style to it that like from my perspective nowadays i think like this is like what brick films should be like essentially it, it's it's very <laughs> brick filmy uh, in response to that, I say yes <laughs> to everything you just said. Yeah. Uh, no, like this is like what gets me excited about brick filming is, you know, somebody like really having like a distinct style and going for it. And like, it's just so clear that this person wanted to make a really fun chase movie, right? Like this is just 
so it, it, like it is an excuse to do these ridiculous shots of like you know a bike chasing a horse chasing a train and you know every single person flying through the air but they all fly through the air slightly differently <laughs> and you know it's it's one of those things where it's 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 excessive right it's in the same way that the night lose at nine i like did too much right like it's like this is not that every shot was done because that was the simplest way to do the shot. It was because I'm going to have fun f making these characters fly through the air and it, take the time to showcase a distinct personality on each of them as they do. Um, it just like the every shot is so rich, um, like all these and like they even when they have a giant mass of people moving as one they have different styles for different masses of people like when the police guards are chasing the like family group the family group is very like they move together but it's disorganized versus the police all kind of filing as one yeah. like that it like the amount of commitment to just that many characters on screen is like something you rarely see and i do love even when the police are moving like through the doorway and like their legs and their arms aren't moving at all and <laughs> you know, it's one of those things where I, I feel, again, it it's something like years ago I might have thought, oh, you know, that that's like a, a technical error. Like you're supposed to move the legs when they walk, but like no, it's so much funnier. It has more character for them to just file as just this mass of police. Just oh, no, 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 it's just I love it now. <laughs> yeah, and I think there's definitely a you know, I mean, what I felt when I was watching this uh, was that like it feels very much like. Um, it's someone who clearly appreciates and enjoys like you know old classic brick films right like um there's there's such a kind of charm to it that's it's just yeah it it wants to be fun and and just hmm. is fun um and it's just like yeah <laughs> it's just a it's just it's quite it's it's just very wholesome i think <laughs> and again like to me this is like better better art in the brick film medium than like most things that get released and I I feel like that would be very confusing for a lot of people to hear like <laughs> they'd look at something that's more like technically brilliant you know like on the surface looks like a masterpiece and think what what do you mean but I, I know what I mean I mightn't be able to articulate but I know <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah people would be like wait but it, it's not just it, it's not smooth enough <laughs> yeah um I think you all have covered major malfunction before on the podcast yeah maybe yeah. but but that's like one of the only other brick films that comes to mind for me in this genre of like it's it's like i mean that's at a whole different level than this because it's like so synchronized to music and all that but right like um so many brick films waste so much time on talking <laughs> right like you like that that is my main critique of the like you know two roommates genre <laughs> is it's just like i don't like lego figures sitting and talking to each other is not the most exciting thing to me so i really appreciate things like this that are just like i'm going to do a crazy chase sequence and you don't need words um uh so yeah this is like exactly my cup of tea so great choice <laughs> yeah i when i saw this i did think hey I know who'd like this, <laughs> so <laughs> it's handy that we had the podcast lined up, yeah. But yeah, Major Malfunction, absolutely one of my favourite brick films of all time. I love Major Malfunction so much. Yeah, I'm sure I'm sure that we've 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 probably talked about it many times in the podcast. I I, I imagine you probably could make a A super cut of us talking about Major Malfunction. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. At least that is his own episode, yeah. But <laughs> But, like, the video quality on that is not great, no. right? Like, Major Malfunction, like, as a thing to watch, is, like, grainy of an era um, and, not and like, not, you know, technically precise in the way that um, uh, Dr. Jobs and his scary laboratory or whatever that one that used 60 frames per <laughs> second uh, and never did anything because that took forever, um, right? It's, uh, but, like, it just it has a reason to exist, right? Yeah. Like it, it, the energy and joy of um, major malfunction is like, yeah. Like when I first saw that, I was like, how is everybody not like screaming to yeah, the rafters exactly. about major malfunction? So glad to hear that you're at least doing the screen. <laughs> yeah. Everybody else. You can always trust Penta to, to like, you know, 
<laughs> talk about obscure brick films. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I, 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 touching again a bit on on um, a family affair. One thing I, I like about it is just like there's there's a certain level of like, um, it's just not ashamed to just be goofy and silly. Like there's, I, I love how like there's one one of the characters just like perpetually has a flaming hat. <laughs> and hmm. you know it's not really it's not really mentioned until you know he lights on his cigar w- with his hat <laughs> just think about that it's just really funny yeah no i i also love the way that it it really you know it feels so monty python to me right like in the best way of you know like it, they're just doing things because they're silly like when they use the micro scale mansion and then they're all rowing up to it. And then it just shows them like at regular size rowing up to the micro scale mansion, because like that's, that works. You don't need to, but it's like, it's an intentional choice. And it's just like this really quick gag blinking. You miss it kind of thing to even realize it happened. But it's like that kind of like, you know, it shows like a certain sort of eye and like awareness of, you know, playing with the medium in a fun way and even when you're making a choice like oh i'm gonna throw in some micro scale um you know you don't just have to do it the way micro scale is done yeah i, I do mm-hmm. i do i do enjoy that that bit quite a lot with when like you know they they get so close to it it, it bumps you know it, it mm-hmm. it's it makes it so obvious that like yeah it's it, 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 it's it knows it's micro scale it knows it's you know it doesn't make sense <laughs> yeah but yeah especially with major malfunction yeah, I agree. It it makes me think like, I I wish more people sort of were tapped into the the idea of like, you know, this this is a great brick film. <laughs> but it it did it did have influence in the bricks in motion community at least. Yeah, there was sort of a trend where people like people who were inspired by its animation style. You could always tell because I, I've definitely said this before, but um, they they'd have a character who's who had a top hat that wobbled around. Um, who moved more like cartoony and dramatically like this again this is one of those yeah. ones that was sort of like doing stuff before the lego movie that the lego movie kind of popularized more broadly in brick filming but yeah major malfunction was was there first and it's it's still great i also just love right the so uh, when i would coach voice actors for the nightly news at nine i would say there is literally no such thing as too over the top for this right (laughs) like to get people out of their normal speaking range enough to like talk like a cartoon character i would be like you know like continues like no take this further be like the happiest you've ever been like this is like you have to take this with absolute seriosity Mm -hmm. while saying the stupidest possible thing like give me more like um that like the mansion in this blows up which is already ridiculous and then it blows up again (laughs) right like it's just this idea of like not only was it a silly thing but then they took it that extra step um you know it just really shows that like they're they're not just repeating tropes they're actually like kind of putting their own spin on them um and you know it just it just sings throughout because there's such a clear vision and voice guiding it and like the fact that there's a cardboard um background of a house mm-hmm. in one shot versus lego in another it doesn't matter right like um it, it might not be fully aesthetically cohesive but it's indifference to certain aesthetic features versus you know like the energy of the the moment um you know is is so consistent you don't even really notice those kind of things unless you're specifically looking for them and it's interesting because it's like one of those things where like a lot of people would be very kind of um hesitant to kind of be like you know oh this is inconsistent whatever but then someone like you know van Deer does this and and you realize like it it, it really doesn't matter like it it, it works <laughs> you know? and of course blander definitely knows that the the old minifig faces with the solid eyes they're just so funny when you were recording the voice acting for 1989 was that always in person yeah basically and so most of the voice actors were people i like knew from college but even after college like when they would live in new york and chicago it's like i would visit new york and i'd be like you know block out your afternoon like we're recording Mm -hmm. all of phil brickley's lines for chapter one right like because while i produced the um the videos at a much slower rate like i could get 
the voice actor um you know they weren't other people it was just me and one person at a time though there was only like one time where i had like the voice actor uh for robophilia and phil brickley in the same room and we were trifacto jones the three of us <laughs> singing together we didn't actually do anything where phil and robophilia talked to each other but um that was so yeah um luckily again with it being a new show they're not there's not a lot of like repartee uh between the characters or if i could i i would you know fill in especially if it, it, someone was talking with malifios like even if i would do a separate recording like i could uh give them something to bounce off of in the moment mm -hmm. yeah because i can imagine that doing it in person is excellent for just being able to provide instant feedback and just do another take like what you're saying is you know the, the happiest you've ever been yeah or just like okay you said that as a, a statement let's do it as a question like Phil Brickley, every single line he did, we would also do a take where he did it as a question <laughs> mark, even though it doesn't make sense. But that was just like a thing that we would, all right, like now I'm going to do it as a question. Just, uh, you know, like just cycle through possibilities because you never know when you're going to find like the one inflection or something and like purposely trying to say it weird mm. just to oh, yeah. break out of like how you say words, right? It's and like these were not trained actors right like so that's the other thing is uh you know some of that might be quite natural to like an actual voice actor of like developing like the distinctive style of a character but having to kind of like push people to draw that out um that was you know trying to get people to to, to really not talk like a human <laughs> was my goal <laughs> yeah i think you you managed to do that very successfully I do think that the voice acting from Malifios is is the standout as well. Of course, that's yourself, so you you could you could do what you want. But yeah, it's it's, it's always just I I just remember the end it, end it of destroys sports destroys my throat every time. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I I'm really proud of uh of of the, of him. So yeah, I'm not gonna do it now because like I like it literally is is painful. <laughs> But yeah, that, that's yeah. why the end of sports has always been one of my favorite uh, parts of my days at nine. I love that one. <laughs> yeah, I, I love that. I love the part where he's just going through like all of a ridiculous list of, of all the like, sports. All the sports, yeah. Blocko, brickety blockety blue ball. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, should we continue on to the the last showcase film? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Dave, do you, do you want to uh, talk about your pick? Uh, a little a little brick film that uh, you may have heard of. <laughs> uh, yes. So I picked um, Copyright or Droits d'Auteur, um, which I'm sure my French is awful, but um, uh, it's a Henry and Edmund or Henri and Edmond uh, film. Um, I don't, like to me, it is like a quintessential brick film. Yeah. So when I was going through the list of brick films you've covered on here, I literally had my playlist of my favorite brick films of all time. And it was just like, okay, check covered. And I was like, wait a minute, y'all haven't talked about copyright. Like this needs to be rectified. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's like a 20, 30 minute brick film. Um, just like the production quality is so um, high, right? Like the lighting, the script work, the voice acting, the the continuity of action scenes. Like it's just like incredible that like it exists um, as like something that was done in stop motion, and like what it, it's just so easy to watch. Like it's just such a good short film on its mm -hmm. own, right? Like even if like the idea of uh, downloading a song illegally um, is not like in the popular parlance as it was when this was released, <laughs> um, right? Like the absurdity of the situation is so clear and so apparent, and just like um, it, it, it does such a good job again of being um, in sync with its medium mm -hmm. um, while not being beholden to it, right? Yeah. Like there are moments where they are very clear like hey we're made of plastic or um you know we're going to throw lego pieces at another car as part of a car chase but like it's not um i don't know it's it's just using that without overly drawing attention to it but drawing the right amount of attention yeah, i don't know i agree just like i love every single thing about this film hmm. I, I could 
talk for it yeah. about it forever. I love the the tone that it balanced so well. I think it's it's um it's such a great kind of um overall film in terms of like yeah, what just what it does as a story. Like I think there's something I, I always love the comedy of ridiculous kind of like results of legally downloading a song and then turning it into like this whole that that somehow leads him being like a fugitive of the law and then being chased, you know, uh, and you know it turns into like an action movie. Um, like that's such a that kind of concept is is always going to be funny to me. Um, but then on on top of that, like having a very kind of fun tone and very kind of have a kind of like Lego e kind of sensibility to it, but at the same yeah. time still having like you know, uh, quiet moments and, and, and be kind of, like, meaningful and, and it leads to a film with, like, you know, characters that you really like and, um, yeah, just overall, just, like, a really just great, like, adventure. <laughs> I do think that, um, like, with the, the town that he sets it in, it is inspired by, like, the old uh, Lego aesthetics, like, old Lego books or, like, old Lego 1980s sets. Um, when you have the, the guy driving around the little yellow car... Like some of those shots, again, it's it's it has the the bright colors and and the old minifig parts, and it's another film that has a, a nice use of the um the Malifio's head when Edmund is in disguise. <laughs> it's just I, it's just an inher- inherently funny face. <laughs> <laughs> I think as well, um, it it, it does have a, a really nice like yeah like sort of a classic Lego aesthetic to it, but it, it feels fleshed out enough to feel like a mm-hmm. real place as well like yeah <laughs> yeah i've always kind of thought of, of, of henry and everyone as being the kind of um the brick film equivalent of wallace and gromit yeah in a lot of ways which would make this the wrong trousers of brick filming i guess which yeah <laughs> i'd consider that accurate as far as being like you know the yeah well yeah that's just like you know the the ultimate masterpiece <laughs> um i th- you know this is um right? Like Henry and Edmund, this is not their first foray, right? Like this is, um, or their last, right? They've had multiple films, but they are very much like individual self-contained stories. Like, yeah, it's Wallace and Gromit is like a perfect analogy. Uh, but yeah, like the, 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 again, the sense of place and style, (laughs) style, (laughs) um, here is just like, you know, it, it's, it's so deliberate, while also having fun you know yeah. it's not like it doesn't get stifled by its um like continuity or sense of place but you know it, it sets up jokes at the beginning that pay off later right like there's just it's just so cohesive but my fit i mean this is one one of my absolute favorite sequences in any brick film ever is the axis trip <laughs> at the fire station like it is, this yeah. is the perfect example of like taking something about the limitations of brick films and taking it from a weakness into a strength right yeah. like each of these characters walking becomes imbued with meaning and suspense in a way that most walk cycles never <laughs> come anywhere close to right like because it matters for the character to walk the same and two characters to walk the same and the fact that you can see slightly that the characters are out of sync right like it actually like makes you appreciate like the different way each character walks and then of course the absurdity of them announcing now i'm turning 30 (laughs) degrees to the right and i'm going to walk towards the door at a moderate pace right like it's just like it, it is absolutely just like i think one of the the smartest but best executed things in the brick film medium because of the way that it like takes this limitation of like the absurd like limitations of how the characters move and uses it as a strength and then like builds that into like like this absurd humor sequence like this is what makes it a masterpiece for me like i mean it's it's a masterpiece also from a technical perspective all these other reasons with that like really to me is just like one of the best things that's ever happened to yeah i agree it's one of the one of the best sequences one of the best set pieces ever in a brick film and and i love that like it's so memorable that you can just name the sequence and like we know what you're talking about that's 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 a great quality of this film like it can be it can be spoken about like like a more sort of legitimate short film or you know, animated film where, yeah, you you remember these scenes and scenarios and events and like 
bits of dialogue and everything. In, in some ways, it's kind of rare to talk about a brick film and be like, this scene, <laughs> you know, because exactly, like, yeah, yeah. most brick films aren't scene, 36 yeah. minutes long. <laughs> oh yeah, because it's 30 minutes, yeah. <laughs> and there's really like no like um, part of this film that feels like it overstays its welcome or it it's not like a great execution of an idea. Um, right, like the opening sequence being annoyed by somebody ringing the doorbell, um, the ridiculous escalation into chase sequences, like the action car chase is like, again, just an incredible piece in its own yeah. right, like that most Brook films would be. Uh, and then the way that the lighting changes throughout like s successive scenes to really feel like the day is progressing, like that continuity of lighting, uh, like thought between shots, like when do you see that in a brick film <laughs> ever? Yeah. <laughs> Besides that here. And and it does it gives different scenes that like memorable, distinct vibe. You know, I really love the uh, the conversation and the sunset like scene and how like it, it, it ends up being so like it's such like a meaningful kind of scene, um, in a way where like I don't think many brick films have managed to achieve that. And and, and for that to come out of a, a brick film that has like sequences as silly as the as the you know walk cycle uh you know kind of scene and and, and like you know the chase scenes and stuff it's, it's really quite an achievement i think i actually feel like mentioning just as sort of a, an aside um that when when i asked you to pick a film for the showcase you did say like oh of course david pagano would have already spoken about greedy greedy bricks by Mirko. you might like to hear that we have met Mirko a couple of times at steiner Eye in germany and austria and like we have mentioned to him that oh yeah you know like uh, Dave Pickett and Dave Pagano still like bring up greedy bricks in like you know sort of um like educational context as like using it as an example of of what can be done with the medium like with just with no no dialogue and little set and, and all that yeah and I mean the ability to show character through movements without articulated joints right mm -hmm. like. It's just a master class in like principles of stop motion that are independent from Lego while also right speaking to the scale that most brick filmers are going to have access to right um so yeah no i mean greedy bricks is like it's the perfect example uh to, to show be it's also like nice and not too long um like David Pagano, uh, it, when he ran those workshops before I joined, would also show like Robata, but like that is way too. <laughs> it's amazing, but it's also like too intimidating yeah. for a newcomer to like look at that. It's the exact opposite of Greedy Bricks, isn't it? Really, <laughs> it is and it isn't right. Like it shows like a a technical finesse that um, is refined, and it's not somebody's first work, right? And it has like a very clear focus. So I think. I see a similarity between them, but yeah, in terms of like scale, yeah. <laughs> it's they're they're pretty far apart on the spectrum. Yeah, I used to show clips of like some of my earliest VHS things whenever I would do an animation workshop because it's so easy for people to forget that the it takes time to get good at art, and so like when I'm running this as like you know a twenty or thirty year old like talking to an eight-year-old i'm like i don't even have the films i made as an eight-year-old mm -hmm. they were awful and st i'm glad they're not on the internet some most days but um you know just to remind them that like this is what i can do now if i show you a clip but here's what i started like and your films today are probably going to look better than that just because you actually have software that's designed to do stop motion animation rather than you know me just guessing with a video camera mm -hmm. Yeah, that's yeah. something I, I try and keep in mind as well. When, when if I ever do like workshops, it's like I like to show like one of my early things and then be like, and this is me now, you know, with with, with the with the idea in mind of like I like the idea of of um, having some of my early stuff on YouTube, um, just because it kind of just gives some context as to like you know that's where I was when I was starting out, um, which isn't entirely true because obviously I I I made so many things before. I, f I, I felt like I could put, them on, put, could put them on YouTube, but yeah. I just felt like mentioning that sort of on the record about Greedy Bricks while, while we have you, but yeah, um, it, copyright. 
I was gonna say I also love sheep. Oh, yeah. Um, oh yeah. Like I think that's like another um, just incredible brick film that just does a really good job taking advantage of um, like the just the Lego eye tiles, <laughs> right? Like, yeah. and it it's showing what you can do without having to go crazy on practical effects. I mean, it's it's still like an incredible piece of work that most people could not come close to uh, until like years of practice and yeah. work but like um it the vibe is just exactly what i think you know we should be celebrating i agree yeah sheep is like yeah uh, actually copyright is an amazing brick film with dialogue and then sheep is a, a great example without dialogue like they each work so well in in their lane yes yeah, it's, it's it is interesting that um uh, maxime marion bo- made both the uh the le- the brick film equivalent of Wallace and Gromit and the brick film equivalent of Shaun the Sheep, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, uh, Sheep is one of those. Another one of those, like you know, generally really, you know, something that I feel like is going to be remembered as a classic. It's it's such a it's such a great film. I think similar to to Coffee White, you know, it, it does feel timeless. You know? Yeah, it is something that will continue to be brought up and used as an example of like, look, look at look at this brick film for this good sort of principle, like this good use of this and that and and the other. Uh, but <laughs> yeah, actually. I I believe that Maxime is planning to release a, a new Henri and Edmund this year, which will be like 40 minutes long or something. Well, it should be this year. Wow. I've not been keeping up because or, I, well, I maybe, did actually... Okay, maybe, maybe next year. <laughs> oh, okay. Because <laughs> um, I actually did take part in the... the, uh, the cause there was like a, a, fun, uh, a fundraiser, a fundraiser yeah. thing for that. Yeah, yeah. I look mm-hmm. forward to seeing, to seeing that. <laughs> I look forward to getting the Blu-ray and seeing the old Henri and Edmund in a like proper hd quality yeah yeah that'd be good it would be amazing if i i, I certainly hope that the uh the, the new one read edmund can reach a similar height as copyright oh yeah for sure i i, I do have like uh, you know every confidence in maxine to oh yeah put it off <laughs> but yeah copyright does sort of feel like a kind of once in a lifetime sort of brick film like everything just comes together yeah that, for sure yeah, well, I said I could talk about it for hours. Now I'm just struggling to say anything specific because there's just like every aspect of it is so well done. And um, it just like when especially when it came out, it was just so in, like, I mean, it's still heads above so much yeah. of like the brick filming output of all That's history. True. Yeah, right. Like it's like an incredible work. But like at the time too, like, you know, because this was it, so pre Lego movie yeah. even, right? Like, just the the level of of finish and thoughtfulness was was you know, yeah, and still is incredibly rare. But it was even more I think uh, before there was the like, you know, there's there's definitely a before and after era to Lego movie um, brick filming probably. But um, yeah, yeah, and I think copyright will just hold up for all time as a classic, as like a sort of perfect ideal <laughs> we, we all dream of reaching <laughs> throughout kind of brick filming there's there's these kind of like uh you know a few examples of of brick filmers and brick films that are you know leaps and bounds beyond their time um like you know the the kind of classic example would be like you know sort of um spot your face in the 2000s and i think that um my henry henry and edmund is, is kind of a another example of that in 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 that time period, um, you know, 2011. Um, because, yeah, I feel like at this point, like, yeah, I, I don't think there are many brick films that feel this kind of polished and, and this kind of well thought out and, and you know, have these mm-hmm. kind of production values on it, like every aspect. Um, Engaging through it. Li- like this does. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and yeah, it has, has that really long one time, but manages to... There's not like a there's not like a, a filler moment in in the in the film at all. Like it's it's yeah. And yeah, I also like I guess you know I mean I could I could mention every single aspect, but the cinematography is is amazing in this film as well. Yeah. It's like every scene has like its its kind of its own kind of look to it. You know, like mm-hmm. different color like color scheme and and it's mm-hmm. like that that, that I, there's like that scene like towards the end um, that building that's just like just really big. It's like in one shot. Um, <laughs> You know, which true, I know yeah. is like you'd appreciate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I I never hesitated from building ridiculously large things that only showed up on screen very briefly. It's definitely you know something I 
I appreciate while also realizing it's a ridiculous yeah. <laughs> like thing from a production viability standpoint. I, I like the same. <laughs> I mean, even just the scale of the town in the background of various, you know, chase sequences, like there's just so much visual depth going on. Um, it's it's very much not build only what the camera mm -hmm. sees. I consider it to, to be like a sort of an intentional joke to like make a set that's so ridiculous just for one shot, just for like an establishing shot. I find <laughs> that really funny. I've made some chase scenes in the past. And I, 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 there's like I have others like in mind and for future projects. And um, whenever I just talk about it with people, that kind of in the, the kind of subject comes up of like, oh, you could just like reuse the same buildings like you know multiple times i'm like yeah i don't want to do that though mm -hmm. i i, I want to like i want every shot to have <laughs> different buildings <laughs> because I, I i i'll know that they're being repeated and i can't do that <laughs> well you just got to set it in a set it on a street where all the houses are supposed to look the same okay that's true actually mm -hmm. no i'll just shoot it in a we call field. that the uh a fixed system approach mm -hmm. oh right yeah yeah yeah, just do to just do a chase sequence in a dystopian future where every building is the same. That that makes it <laughs> relatively easier then. <laughs> but um, yeah, you know, just before we started recording, we were saying that, like, we were we were also surprised to um, be reminded that copyright has never actually been an official showcase pick, and but it has been mentioned numerous times on the podcast. But I think we're always happy to have another excuse to talk about it. It's it's always worth talking about. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I think this, this, this yeah, I think it's kind of like one of those films, like where it's like undoubtedly we've talked about it so many times, but it's 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 kind of a thing of like, um, I think in the you know in the past we probably we probably thought like oh yeah it's a, it's a film we talk about anyway, but like if we have an excuse to just talk about it you know in the showcase, it's like yeah we won't pass we won't pass an opportunity. <laughs> I just had a thought actually we. We d haven't asked anything about uh, the Lego Movie Reveals project because, you know, you haven't had releases for a, a number of years now. But I was quite happy. You know, I, I asked you to do a still photograph for the Lego Movie Rebuilt project um, with Fabuland figures. But I was really happy that you were actually interested in uh, doing some animation as well. Yeah, now I just need to actually <laughs> <do that. laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I really enjoyed... Um, uh, building the rainbow and uh, will one of these days uh, actually uh, mm -hmm. animate it. But yeah, even just doing the test shot and reinstalling, well, actually installing Dragon Frame on this computer for the first time because it's been so long, like I have a different computer, just getting everything back. It's like, oh yeah, this is how this works. And uh, I need to figure out the frame sheet thing and all those things again it's it's nice to get back into it and and have something that i can just be a small part in and not have to and with my propensity to make things more complicated um you know it's okay because it's still only like three <laughs> seconds total not you know uh not yeah. too long so i think a number of us are in a similar sort of boat where we've built a couple of things and yeah, we'll we'll get around to shooting it one of these months. <laughs> That's where I'm at. <laughs> but yeah, so <laughs> yeah. I guess I, I I guess I didn't really have anything specific in mind, but yeah, I don't know. Um, I guess you've already answered the sort of question of like any observations about returning to um animation after a number of years away. Yeah, I mean, I think just um part of it is um uh, you know I used to have my spaces kind of set up for filming you know like tripod lights um a, you know a table where i knew that's where you know things i was going to film would go uh you know especially during my even if it was an animation my brick 101 content producing days i just needed a dedicated space and like i have not had space dedicated to those things in a long time mm -hmm. so just taking the time to set up my I do have a room that's full of Lego, but like setting up the table down there to be ready to film, I was like, oh yeah, like, I mean, like all of these steps <laughs> and like sandbags so things don't fall over. It's, uh, it's definitely nice to like, okay, I at least have done those kind of basic steps of just like being ready to even do any kind of filming or shooting. 
because uh, and I did that even just for the Fabuland shot of just like getting my lights out of storage type thing and um, yeah and and like doing that and like feeling like ah I accomplished a thing and then when you kind of put out the call for like hey there's still unclaimed things I looked and I found one I was like okay yeah no and that, like I did the one photograph I can do you know whatever eighty shot individual frames I'll need to do to get through <laughs> you know the three. Uh, shot sequence that uh, I claimed with a rainbow. And of course I always wonder um, is there any any chance that you might be interested in making another uh, stop motion brick film um, just, just sort of for the sake of it as sort of a hobby endeavor or is it sort of too much of a, a commitment too much of an ask I, these I mean, days? I mean I I'm not going to say never in my life but not, not anytime <laughs> soon. It's like I my own like creative energies have flown in a different direction. So, you know, when I'm doing things for fun now, like I'm working on designing a Game Boy game, right? Like, uh, and you know, there's pixel art and there's animation. So mm -hmm. there's, it's not, not connected, but right. It's, it's, I'm like a stop motion animation of anything like the night losing <laughs> nine. I'm like, yeah. yeah, I, I, I just like it. And it's hard because, like, I never was able to do things small. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, I, I wouldn't expect um, anything on the scale of another Mike and Use at Nine chapter. <laughs> yeah, but, like, you know, even any individual segment of that, right? Like, I would do, like, oh, I'm going to alternate between these new segments, which will mostly be static shots of people talking at desks, and I can just have still frames, and then I'll do these short commercial breaks that'll be more fun but they'll be short but you know then it, like i would always have these crazy ideas and then i would commit to these ridiculous things where i had all these montages that each had a unique setting even though they were only on screen for again like two to three seconds <laughs> uh interspersed in the news episode or i would cut away to a flashback um and so like yeah. It's kind of one of those things as well as like as much as you might say to yourself, oh, I'll just make a simple brick film. Mm -hmm. If you've, you know, if you've gone, if you've gone out of your way to make these like, you know, huge like films with these massive sets, uh, hugely complicated animation, like there's no way that you can kind of like make yourself not want to do that again. I think that's the thing, you know, like going going back to small scale um, after making something that big is it's not an easy thing to do. I don't think. Yeah, and I think also, like, I've been out of the game so long at this point, like, I'm not even sure what I would be trying to do with, like, a minifigure that hasn't already been done. Again, like, the Lego movie coming out, like, you know, introduced, so, like, in Unikitty, like, just as a concept, has covered territory in a way that used to be kind of unbroken and that I was able to, like, be unique by doing, whereas now it's been done in different ways. So like, what am I, like, I don't know that, like there's no sort of specific thing that has pulled me into like, this needs hmm. to exist and it doesn't. And I'm the one who has to make it exist, you know? And uh, so like the concepts I have for what the next, you know, thing in the story would be, like they're ridiculous. Like you go into a dragon's mind and there's a theme park that's all dragon themed mm -hmm. like no there's no way to do that that is is not going to take years right yeah, like yeah. and that is one scene right like it so every concept i have that has been exciting is way too big to you know even think about committing to so i don't know um you know and it's like it's no longer my yeah. life um hmm. so it's just like i i have other things in my life and like i own a house now and that's a thing and there's projects to do around <laughs> the house and there's just like other stuff that when i was starting night lose at nine like i was living by myself i didn't have a husband uh, or a dog you know like the not like i don't have children so right like i'm, I'm i don't have that <laughs> level of like no personal time for artistic endeavors but it's just like it's of a different scale whereas like night loose at nine when i was doing it like on my way to work on the bus i was like editing things on my laptop and on the way home i was editing again <laughs> and then like at night like i was filming or 
working on something like it was it was like you know it consumed my life for for a good number of years and like um it's you know so and like that was just the way my process works so i can't it's not like i chose to be as over the top and absurd as all my stuff was i just like that is just how i am mm -hmm. when i create something like that so you know it's 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 very hard for me to even figure out what would be another scope i mean like the magic picnic um was really great because it was like we had a very specific reason for it while also doing our own thing but it was also like collaborative with pagano we had like deadlines and like that's where you know i think the lego movie rebuilt project is like that is a level mm -hmm. i can commit to like um i'm not responsible for the whole thing i can do my own thing but even that like yeah i'll get to it one <laughs> of these months yeah. so well, it uh, so if there's more opportunities like that, you know, um, I'm not saying I'll never do it, but a solo project of any kind of significance, I just, I don't know. It's just not in me it, right now. It will, it'll mean yeah. a huge amount to me to know that there's original animation from you in the, the Lego Movie Rebuild project, so I'm really appreciative of that. Of course. But, you know, I found it pretty admirable when you stopped doing uh, Brick One One as like a full-time thing that... You just set it uploading like whatever you wanted to the same channel. <laughs> like you had this, you know, nearly nearly million yeah. subscriber channel, but you're just like, yeah, just you know, video game, yeah, whatever. <laughs> like <laughs> speed runs or just random thoughts. Yeah, like I found that kind of amusing. <laughs> yeah, no, it's been it's like my relationship with my YouTube channel is is weird. Um, it's it's. I mean, I, like, I I think everybody's relationship to YouTube is mm -hmm. weird, but, like, when you think about the history of, like, art forms, like, we didn't expect actors in the past to keep doing the same thing they did in one movie forever, and that's the only thing we knew them for, and that was, I don't know, like, just, like, creative professionals before social media were able to just be parts of multiple projects, and they might, like have themes throughout their career, but there wasn't this like kind of expecting that every single thing they could produce ever is going to be the exact mm -hmm. same thing, yeah. you know? I mean, I know certainly I've sort of had the idea drilled into me that like, oh, I, I couldn't upload something outside of brick filming to my, my main channel. It'll kill my channel. So I just, I really enjoyed seeing you just putting up whatever you wanted on this massive channel. <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, like, the, it, it definitely uh, it was definitely part of my, like, work after um, kind of burning out on YouTube to, like, reconnect with um, YouTube, be, like, and get back to the vibe of, hey, mom, I just made a little video. You're going to watch <laughs> it now, right? <laughs> like, when I was eight, right? Like like i like this thing and i'm putting it in the place where i show things to people and uh uh you know it's definitely been like my relationship to it has been like oh sometimes i feel like i'm intentionally kind of like encouraging people to leave in some ways like just by not giving them what they want mm -hmm. um but also yeah there's still a part of me that's like oh but dave the channel and i'm like it's fine. <laughs> like it keeps growing even as I am sabotaging it. So, and also like it's for me, right? Yeah, like true. at the end of the day, uh, it is ultimately, you know, uh, even if only, you know, a small, small fraction of the audience that I built will watch anything that I upload now because algorithm, mm -hmm. algorithm. Um, you know, like it's still going to be more people than would have watched anything I made you know, a decade ago. Mm, um, yeah. And, you know, like, why, like, I earned that. So, like, I'm going to, like, uh, and now that I don't have to worry about it being uh, long-term viable in the, the way that I did before, yeah, like, it's, why not? Yeah. I'm too old to, to stop doing, to <laughs> stop things. I've, yeah. I've spoken to people, um, you know, in the, like, in the past about, like, what I would need to do about, like, you know, if I, if I wanted to, like, I don't know, grow my social media or channel or anything. And it's so daunting um, to the point where I'm like, you know what, I don't want to do that. I don't want to, like, make my life kind of... I don't know. About keeping social media accounts alive, yeah. 
Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't want to have to I have to actually go on Twitter. Um, I don't want to, you know. I, and like, yeah, I, at that point, I'm just like, you know what? I just, I'm happy just doing what I want to do. I'd rather do what I want to do than, um, you know, get views that. <laughs> and yeah. Yeah. No. I mean, at the, at the end of my time on YouTube, like, uh, I the the content I was creating was not the stuff that I got me into sharing videos on YouTube, right? Like. Uh, it was what can I do that will uh, satiate satiate the algorithm, and I'm not morally opposed <laughs> to. <laughs> like that was the line, you know. Like I do, I have not really ever played Five Nights at Freddy's, the game series. I played it for like five minutes one. It's like not my thing, but like I happened into this kind of windfall in the algorithm of. Lego plus Five Nights at Freddy's was really hot and did better than anything else I had ever done. And so I did anything I could that was even remotely related and just to like earn money. And it's just like, at that point, why am I doing yeah. that? I, I do have to briefly just um, make the joke that uh, you played five minutes of Freddy's. <laughs> 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 oh that's great i love that yeah yeah it's, it's funny that you mentioned like the, the comments sort of like you know demanding or begging for the old sort of uh, videos i i got a bit of that like i uh, for, it has, doesn't really happen anymore but for a while i'd always get comments on anything i upload that wasn't benny and lee that was make more benny and lee make more benny and lee and like i guess I, I felt a little bit mean that I wasn't doing that and everyone was demanding it but at the same time I was thinking but I'm just I'm just not I'm, I'm just I'm, I'm onto something else now yeah and I, I, I you know I, I think that we're getting to a point of um, you know creators um, so like for lack of a better term of you know people who make a living uploading content to TikTok or YouTube or these different places because this wasn't a career before mm -hmm. right like in this specific way being open about like how they will often become famous for one video which is like a fraction of themselves and then like i just came across one randomly the other day and it was this person talking about this one video she made that has like a billion views across multiple platforms but she's a musician and no one listens to her music right because like if it's not related to the <laughs> one video that was super super popular it just doesn't perform right and like these algorithms are not geared towards sustainable careers for creators they're geared towards what is going to serve the platform and um you know like understanding what to expect out of these platforms and what ways there are to build sustainable businesses. You know, Patreon is kind of crashing and burning for various reasons, but like, you know, that for a while was, I think, like a really good model of, um, you know, more things that are driven by what your audience wants to see out and it doesn't have to be algor algorithmic in the same way. Um, but yeah, it's also uh, yeah. uh, Bricks of Motion patrons uh, continue to support us. For, uh... <laughs> <laughs> but no, uh... perfect plug. Yeah, 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 yeah. Three <laughs> hours deep into a podcast, <laughs> time to plug the Patreon <laughs> for <laughs> maximum return. But, um... <laughs> but yeah, I think we, we've we have sort of come full circle now, and we're but before we uh, start talking about the YouTube algorithm again. <laughs> Um, I actually do want to talk a, a briefly on something that you were saying um, just, you know, a, a comments ago about when it comes to doing, you know, you're, you're focusing, you know, on different things. Like, I think it's, it's, it's really good. and obviously really healthy to recognize that like, there's, you, you know, there's going to be different phases of your life where like your focus is going to be on different things. Um, and like for you, like that, you know, at the moment that, you know, brick filming isn't like the, that thing you're focusing mm. on, but you're still, creatively making stuff in in other fields and other you know um and it, it, i think it's you know yeah i guess it's uh, you know very you you can only really create these things that you you want to make if you are actively wanting to make those things <laughs> you know and, and and are if that is where your focus is you know there's no shame and in like, ignoring the people like me who are asking when the next brick film is <laughs> absolutely yeah <laughs> you you ultimately you, and you know you have to think about your own your own right. happiness and your own you know, where your creative mind is currently focused on, you know?
Yeah, no, I've I've tried to be as transparent as possible about that on my channel. Of course, the video where I like said I'm stopping doing YouTube didn't get that many views. So like years later, people are still like, "Whatever happened to Brick 101?" And I'm like, I literally made a video that explained all of this. Go watch it, right? Like, um, <laughs> I don't know. I I, I try to recognize like my power in platform and try to model for the next generation how to just not give up at a certain point <laughs> about right like these perceived commitments because you did <laughs> something once right and um like making art making brick films is hard enough when you're just doing what you want to do and like the more you let you know, your creativity or your, your passion be dictated by to like all these sort of other considerations, you know, it can just sap the, the joy out of it. And then like, you're not going to be produced, like the work is, is going to reflect that. So it's fine to like, get yourself paid and do a commission for the Lego company. I support that. But also just knowing what you're doing when you do that versus when you're building mm -hmm. for yourself. And that's, I think 19 years at nine, yeah, to me, it, it has always exemplified that sort of joy. Like, it, it's it's real. It's nice. It, it never became this, like, behemoth that just ran for a million installments that were just chasing the algorithm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was like, oh, not another Nightly News at 9. Oh, damn it. <laughs> I said nightly. What did you expect? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, only two days' time have passed in the c canon of Nightly News at Nine, which is kind of silly <laughs> um, when you think about it. Um, uh, like, I had a plan for f the first four days of that canon, and then, you know, sketches for weeks later. And I'm just like, yeah, <laughs> we got two days. It's uh, it's a it's it's a good fun time, and I, I loved every aspect of everything mm -hmm. I did on it. So, like, I have no regrets. And I'm able to, you know, but it was it was so much like a product yeah. of the time, right? Like, even me selling DVDs, <laughs> like that's nobody has a DVD player anymore. I mean, yes, they do, but like, yeah, you know, some of the ways I thought about monetizing, like, left, and uh, you know, I I am working on like a new IP in in the sense of coming up with a new. Um, character but it's not any you know and it re reflects my sensibilities in similar ways but it's like it's for a video game it's totally different but like you know that's um to the extent that you know the spirit of my work is uh what interests people like there will be other things i will make that will uh, exist and be available at some point that mm -hmm. i can say that mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, I i did i mentioned that copyright is like a sort of once in a lifetime brick film and i feel the same way about 19 news at nine it's like it's once in a lifetime in that it's like miraculous that it even exists in the form that it does and it basically could only have come out like could have been made in the time frame that it was yeah but um i'm looking at the the time now that this recording is going for <laughs> yeah <laughs> and i'm wondering if, if we should yeah. um, wrap things up <laughs> yeah have fun <laughs> editing uh, always do <laughs> yeah. yeah um yeah, this is like we always we always over one. We always go crazy about times. You, you you get you get three people in a room and uh, you know get to talk about brick films. Um, it's it's gonna it's gonna happen, you know. <laughs> yeah, we, but, we just um, have to cut ourselves off at well, some point. Yeah. Yeah, we have to force ourselves. Well, thank you for thank having you so me much. on. You know, I really appreciate you thinking of me, even though you know it. it I'm past <laughs> my prime of brick filming days. <laughs> Um, yeah. you know. I mean, you know, I think that your, your kind of, your filmography is, is like, you know, it's, it's always going to be relevant, yeah. like within break filming. It's and timeless. It's, it's, and it's something that I yeah. will continue to bring up to people as something that like an example of something that they, it would serve them well to take influence from. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I'm, I'm really deeply honored by, you know, the, um, the depth at which you've, you know, watched and understood what I spent so much time putting that effort into, you know, it like really, you can't ask for anything more than that when you make art is to have that level of, to inspire that level of devotion in any way. Right. You know, I, I think of, you know, film criticism as, as actually like a, a form of love to mm -hmm. the medium. So, 
you know, you all as um, like that episode where you talked about Night Lose at Nine brought me so much joy to like feel the impact and 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 feel valued as an yeah, artist. Thank you. So thank you so much that's, for that's all really that. That's really nice for us to hear as well. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that means that means so much yeah, to hear. Yeah, it does mean a lot. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, obviously, this is a rather niche endeavor, so for it to be meaningful like that, yeah, it's it's wonderful to hear. <laughs> you know, in the past, we would have been like nervous to ask, you know, like, wait, you know, ask, mm-hmm. you know, Brick One Hundred One to to join us and then a podcast? No way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I, 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 that's something I've uh, again I've actively tried to dismantle like the mythology of mm-hmm. myself. Um, especially to like other brick filmers who are like over the age of 18. <laughs> like if they reach out to me, I'm like, Hey, do you ever just want to talk? Like, I, I'm happy to talk to you as a human. And like, I, you know, I'm not just like, a, I like, I don't actually have that much going on. I'm not a celebrity <laughs> to, to other, anybody other than like people exactly like you and me. So, um, yeah, it's cool. I, and it's, it's nice to be able to, um, yeah, just, hear people talk about like oh this was my childhood and you know um all that kind of stuff so mm-hmm. yeah well yeah um yeah thank you thank you so much uh yeah for joining us and um it was a pleasure thank you so much and goodbye everyone goodbye goodbye <laughs> <laughs>